Good morning, everyone. It's Monday, April 4th. This is the Planning, Housing, Economic Development Committee, and we're continuing our review of the Silver Spring downtown and adjacent communities master plan. And uh, we're going to work our way through some major elements today. So we're joined by our planning team and many others. Um, and uh, the memo today begins uh, with a continuing review of the transportation section. So we'll turn it to Glen Orlin, um, and then we will uh, shift back to the zoning and other elements of the plan. Um, so in a second, I will turn it to you, Glenn. One moment, I'm just going to turn off my camera for just a quick second. I'll be right back. Okay, Glenn, you want to take us in, and we can we'll go to planning as as uh, you know structured through the conversation. Sure. Um, if I can start just with a point of personal preference, um, since Carolina has a better planning school than Kansas, I expect everybody here to be rooting for Carolina tonight. Okay. Is that a done deal. <laughs> I think a lot of people on this call actually went to Carolina, so there you are. Um, continuing on with the uh, last work session on Mar March 28th, we went through most of the transportation items. We have a couple left and I'll also be covering school adequacy as part of this plan. So uh, the first item uh, where we left off has to do with the green loops. Uh, the final draft proposes a, a set of two sets or two loops around um, uh, Silver Spring CBD, one in the central area uh, starting um, at the intersection of East West Highway and Colesville Road and running uh, southeast on East West Highway to Georgia Avenue then east on Burlington Avenue across the tracks to Fenton Street, north on Fenton Street up to um, to Spring Street and then um, I'm sorry to, to Cameron, Cameron Street and then uh, Cameron Street West uh, over to uh, past Georgia Avenue to, to 2nd Avenue, south on 2nd Avenue one block to Colesville Road and Colesville Road back to East West Highway. That's this, what's called the central loop. Um, uh, the cost for that, uh, well, first of all, the, what the intent of that loop is to pr provide uh, essentially a very green um, way for bikers and walkers to uh, traverse through one part of Silver Spring to another. Uh, a lot of um, tree buffer, a, a lot of area for stormwater management, uh, separated bike lanes, um, and on East West Highway, uh, at least, um, well, I'm sorry, the, the, and that, that's basically it. It also connects parks within the, uh, the CBD. Then there's an uh, outer loop, uh, outer green loop, which follows the, real, the absolute periphery of the CBD, uh, following along Eastern Avenue, which recognized actually not in Maryland, but is in the District of Columbia, uh, and then goes through Jessup Lair Park, um, up Fenton Street and then back through the East Silver Spring neighborhood and some local streets through some neighborhood greenways um, and eventually up to uh, Cedar Lane and um, Cedar Street and Spring Street um, around to um, uh, to uh, uh, 16th Street and down 16th Street back to Eastern Avenue. Um, and then finally, there is a series of, of uh, conceptual uh, idea of of green loop connectors, which would connect, connect the inner loop or the central loop with the outer loop. Uh, as far as the cost of these uh, facilities, um, DOT has estimated that the cost of the Burlington Avenue and East West Highway uh, portions of uh, the central loop to be uh, $46 million roughly, um, and 46.4 million. Uh, the, the section of Cameron Street is another 4.8 million. I'll be talking that, about that in a minute. Um, the Fenton Street section is actually in the CIP now. Uh, what's being built or will be built next few years and program the CIP is essentially is the eastern section of the center loop. Um, and that's uh, now costing about um, 11 million, 11 and a half million dollars. Um, 
And then the only piece that's missing in terms of a cost estimate is uh, the piece of Second Avenue and Colesville Road, which DOT did not uh, estimate. Uh, there are no estimates for the outer loop um, uh, because according to DOT, there wasn't enough definition for what that really meant, nor are there uh, cost estimates for the connectors uh, because it is just at this point a concept and there's not uh, really an idea necessarily specifically as to what would be done on those roads. And the costs I mentioned, does that, I just remind you from last time, uh, these are in 2022 dollars and uh, reflect design and construction costs does not include land acquisition at all, nor does it include utility relocation. I don't suspect there'd be much in the way of land acquisition because most of this is staying within uh, existing right of way or will, will be in dedicated right of way, but there will be considerable additional costs for utility relocation uh, for, for these roads. So these are uh, underestimates. Uh, and just as background for what I'm about to say next, uh, recall my point is that the even with the uh, certain things that were deleted from last week's um, work session, uh, the cost estimate for this plan is extraordinarily high. And the idea is to try to make this plan at least somewhat more affordable over time. And so the thought here is that uh, where it is important to actually have um, a good bike and ped separation from traffic uh, on the major roads, East West Highway and Georgia Avenue and Burlington Avenue, Fenton Street, et cetera, uh, because there the travel speeds are higher and the volume is higher, posing more of a danger for bikers, at least certainly not providing a, a, a comfortable ride for bikers and, or, and not, not as comfortable as could be for pedestrians. But on the local streets, which are county streets, um, the volumes are not very high the speeds are not very high and the need to actually provide that protection, some of it which already exists in the way of parking lanes and some of which um, for, for bikers, frankly, a either conventional bike lane or a shared street um, would work passably well because again, the danger there is not evident. So uh, with that, let me go through the specifics. Um, what I'm saying about the green loops is that uh, most of it is actually either program, in the case of Fenton Street, or East West Highway, Burlington Avenue, or state highways. And it's plausible to think, in fact, the um, uh, uh, fiscal impact statement suggests that half the costs will be picked up by the state. Uh, that really sort of hasn't happened yet, but because it is a state highway, they, it's being stipulated that the state would pay for half in the long term. But it's at least plausible to think that would happen. But the local streets, that's our entire responsibility. It's 100% on us. Um, Cameron Street, um, the one I want to focus on first, between Spring Street and 2nd Avenue, uh, in both the bikeway plan that was approved four years ago and in this plan calls for separated bike lanes, which again means that uh, there is a physical separation between the motor vehicle lanes and where the bike lanes are, and oftentimes between the bike lanes uh, and, and sidewalks. Uh, and so it calls for removing the parking on the north side of the road in creating grass buffers between the, uh, a new narrow roadway uh, and proposed by separated bike lanes and another set of landscape buffers between the bike lanes and the sidewalks. If you have with you the, um, the supplement, um, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about in the next few minutes are, are figures that are showing up in here. And they're actually, would be part of the plan. Um, uh, official part of the plan, it's not an appendix, it's in the plan. Uh, it's shown on figure 30 in the plan. Uh, DOT estimates that the cost of the of these improvements on Cameron Street from 2nd Avenue to um, Spring Street would be $4.8 million, again, without the utility relocation costs. Uh, today, what you see out there is um, uh, two lanes. You have parking on both sides, and you do have a conventional six-foot-wide striped bike lane on both sides of, of um, both the eastbound and westbound on Cameron Street. Um, uh, my recommendation is basically leave things the way they are. Um, it's a perfectly good bikeway. Uh, again, volume is low, speeds are low, and uh, it, the frankly, the benefits from providing uh, the separate buffers uh, and, the, and the separated bike lanes just doesn't uh, warrant the cost. In fact, the sidewalks that currently exist would be wider um, in some cases than, um, than would be in the plan. Uh, and there is sufficient protection for pedestrians 
in that you have the parking lanes on both sides separating motor vehicle traffic from pedestrians. So we'll, we'll stop with that. My recommendation on Cameron Street is to leave it as is today as a um, uh, showing us in the plan as a bikeway with uh, conventional bike lanes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, thank you for your recommendation. Um, you know, I've been chewing over this uh, myself here, and my inclination is to leave these in the plans, but I recognize that adopting them or actually building them is going to be quite a reach. And there's very little development anticipated to make this a reality. Like on Cameron Street, you know, United Therapeutics has already redeveloped a substantial share of one segment of Cameron and uh, pretty seems pretty unlikely that there's going to be redevelopment of the remaining buildings up to Georgia and then from Georgia down to second you know again I don't really anticipate much redevelopment there so you know maybe there's a site I don't know I mean there's the county parking garage um but I, I just don't know how this is really going to come to reality quite honestly if if it is contingent upon uh having more space with wise than presently exists um so i view this you know as a ultra long term idea here um and perhaps there's an interim treatment that is you know uh better um than what we have today i do tend to agree about slow speeds there generally now and not having i don't think there's major issues with bikeability on cameron for example now but um but i think that this is seeking to do something different as i read it it's not just about creating safe biking infrastructure i think it's about creating an overall built environment that is you know transformationally different or is is you know uh, just a very different environment um and you know i like that vision um and whether we could actually afford to build it and in where uh, you know i think is very much an open question um and there's a lot of issues on cameron about future parking um and you know those street spaces i have to say i use those street spaces all the time <laughs> all the time uh, i've got family that lives on cameron we go to restaurants on Cam you know on right that all set uh you know uh, it would be uh, you know um i wouldn't be i wouldn't be I, I have to i have to say those street spaces are are valuable if there is sufficient parking in the garages you know people can habituate to parking in the garages instead of the street i think that's also quite realistic and i think in general that's kind of the way that we have to be moving is use the garages not the street you know that's that's just a habit. It's just a habit, and people could move in that direction. But um, in any event, um, so my my inclination here is to, or my I would keep these in while recognizing there's some significant barriers to actually bringing them about. And um, I understand the fiscal motivation here, uh, and you know I think to be clear, we have no idea you know how and when we might be able to build these. But uh, I don't think this is the kind of plan where we're seeking to reconcile the cost of the infrastructure, because this isn't really a this isn't really about, I think, uh, making transportation balance. This is just about creating a different environment. That's how I interpret it anyway. But let's hear what Gwen has to say and Kat and Katie as well. Yeah, I'd just like to make a couple of remarks, but then turn it over to um, our transportation planner, Katie Bencarini. I, I think um, Chair Reamer stated it well, which is this is not about adding um, transportation facilities. It is about quality of place. It is about trying to create um, a loop that is not just a loop for transportation, but that is a green loop. We've left out that word green in this discussion. Uh, it's important to include opportunities for increasing tree canopy in downtown Silver Spring. It is important to offer opportunities for stormwater management. 
in downtown Silver Spring, it is important to create a really special public realm. Those are the kinds of actions that are going to be our economic development strategy for downtown Silver Spring and that are going to make it um, possible to see the great growth that has happened in Silver Spring continue. Um, and so, uh, you know, I will tell you that our public realm in Silver Spring, although functional, is uh, one of the biggest drawbacks in Silver Spring. The sidewalks are broken. The uh, utility poles are in the middle of sidewalks. There's um, no green. It's all um, it's all gray <laughs> on many of these uh, older streets. And um, as we move forward, and, and we do have some redevelopment opportunities, the, the, bank, the former bank building at the corner of Georgia and Cameron uh, may well be coming in as a, um, as a redevelopment. But, you know, as we uh, look at both the redevelopment that we can generate, that can generate public infrastructure, but also other ways to generate funding for public infrastructure, which I know we're going to be talking about later with the SIF. That is the whole point of the SIF is to say Silver Spring can have nice things too. <laughs> and uh, we can figure out some ways to do that um, by letting development pay for some of those nice things. Uh, Katie, I'll let you answer the specific questions on the cross section. Perfectly stated. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to confirm everything that Director Wright said, that we are trying to make this a truly comfortable and attractive place for walking and biking. Um, the planning board talked extensively about how we need to really make this a choice and not focus just on the utility of it. Um, and so everything that, that she was saying about the trees and the, the appropriate spacing is very, very important. I think a couple of other things I want to mention, too, is that Cameron Street is going to be a major east-west connection on the top of Silver Spring at the north end. Uh, we have the recreational regional center at the end of it, and we've also got United Therapeutics on the east end. This is a major important connection in the downtown. Um, I think another thing I want to mention too, uh, so uh, Mr. Reamer, you were talking about how we're worried that maybe there isn't a lot of development up here and maybe there isn't going to be a lot of frontage improvements. That's not the only way that we get these improvements. We also get them with off-site LATR. And in fact, we had a project recently come in on 2nd and Fenwick that part of their LATR mitigation was to pay to improve these bike lanes to um, make them separated and not just the conventional bike lanes. Um, I think if um, the planning board chair was here, he would be telling you, because we talked about this in advance, that... Um, we are really concerned about the conventional bike lanes that are on there today. That is a level of traffic stress that is unacceptable for an urban area. What you have right now are um, bike lanes immediately up against the door zone. That's also an area where, you know, like Ubers tend to, to gather, which makes sense. I mean, that's as close as they can get to the curb if there's a car that's already parked there. That's where deliveries tend to block those bike lanes. They're not as highly functional or um, as comfortable as they really could and should be as they are master planned per the bicycle master plan. Um, I appreciate what Dr. Orland is saying about the sidewalk widths, but actually I want to point to the cross section that it's an eight foot sidewalk with a six foot buffer. And right now today, the sidewalks are about 15 feet. So in between the trees, you're still getting a very deep buffer and a very comfortable walking experience with this cross section. Um, this cross section may not be in the immediate term, but it is our long-term vision for it. And if we don't put this in here, we have no leverage to ask for developers to contribute to this vision um, and to be able to achieve it. So I, I do appreciate it. it may not be quick. It may not be soon, but it's what we ultimately want. And we should keep it in there so that we can achieve it. Um, I'm, I'm looking around to see my colleagues if there's anything else they wanted me to hit on, but I think those were really the big things that we wanted to touch on. Thank you. Um, well, important point there about LATR, by the way, we'll be getting to that later. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you make a good point here. You know, we want to transform Silver Spring into a improved place and the infrastructure contributes to that. And the Green Loop is a different vision for the infrastructure in Silver Spring, and um, it would make Silver Spring really stand out. There's no question about that. And so, you know, there are impacts of leaving this on, which is frontage. Um, I don't think there's a ton of frontage to be negotiated for on Cameron, so it may just be LATR fees 
um, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but um, again, that was kind of my under, underlying point on camera, but that's just camera. And there's plenty of other development opportunities in the district. Um, Councilmember Friedson and then Councilmember Dwanda. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, well, I appreciate that. I, I was wondering, I mean, we got into Cameron pretty quickly and, um, you know, I think it, it would be helpful for uh, planning to describe the question of the green loop itself, you know, vis-a-vis -vis a street grid, uh, because I do think that there are, uh, I don't want to say competing uh, uh, discussions, but there are you know, different points that have been made of whether or not, you know, building upon, you know, uh, a, a, an improved street grid is a better approach or whether the green loop, you know, which is something new uh, is a better approach. So I'd love to hear that from planning. And then, uh, you know, specifically related to Cameron, uh, but, but you know, broadly as well, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about the implementation of infrastructure like this and, and how you foresee it. I mean, we've talked a little bit uh, about that and that's a long-term vision and we're not sure how quickly it's going to happen, but ultimately, you know, your goal here is to have the opportunity to be able to, uh, to, to get some of these improvements out of certain redevelopments. Uh, but it begs the question of, you know, how that will work, of what level of collaboration and communication will happen with property owners, because we have heard, uh, you know, concerns about deliveries and loading and uh, how existing head bike uh, interactions uh, work, you know, on a site-by-site -site basis and how that, uh, you know, dynamic works, not just necessarily with planning, but with Department of Transportation. And I think that's an important piece uh, of this as well. So I, I'd love to hear from planning on both of those, which are related to Cameron specifically, because there are some concerns that have been raised specifically uh, about Cameron, but uh, it's also kind of a, you know, more global question and, and uh, dynamic with the Green Loop itself. So I'm going to let Atara really talk about the whole concept of the green loop. The green, and I would just say the green loop is not um, a substitution for creating a strong um, street grid and for breaking up super blocks and some of the other things we've talked about. It is actually complementary to that idea of having a strong street grid, but having um, the connections. But I'm going to let Atara address the, the concept of the Green Loop. Thanks, Lynn. Um, everyone, so uh, going back, I'll just take everybody back for one minute to the previous plan, uh, because in a way, the Green Loop is responding to sort of the new way we see and experience Silver Spring. Uh, in, you know, in, in 2022. And um, the old plan was basically, if you could draw a diagram of it, right, you would draw a thick red line down Colesville and one down Georgia, and there was a big star in the middle. Now all the plan was sort of focused on those two really big streets and what could happen at the intersection. And of course, that jump started the revitalization that was key and so fundamental to what we have today in Silver Spring. But today in Silver Spring, what we found is that now we have a thriving downtown that has numerous different neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods have sort of main spines, main streets that people want to be on. Everybody wants to walk on Fenton Street. People enjoy walking on East West Highway, much more so than Georgia and Colesville. We're not going to be able to take transit and the cars off of Georgia and Colesville completely. Those are major roadways that connect Silver Spring with DC and the rest of Montgomery County. But when we looked at the way Silver Spring functions and the fact that a true sort of typical grid is complicated because you have the rail, which divides and cuts off South Silver Spring from the rest of the downtown. And that was one of our major challenges to address. That we looked and thought, you know, if we talk about a loop, and I would say the central loop is the key piece of the green loop. If we talk about a loop where we can connect those main, those sort of main streets, if you will, of the different neighborhoods of Silver Spring, Fenton Street being the main street of Fenton Village, taking you up into Ellsworth. And then in our vision, Cameron Street is the new main street for downtown North with UT at one end, uh, the new rec center and sort of mixed use development at the other end, numerous development sites uh, along the middle, including the garage, including two former bank sites uh, and a few others that we've spoken to people about over the course of our engagement of this plan, imagining that as sort of a spine of the downtown north and coming around and of course East West Highway being the main street, if you will, of South Silver Spring, taking you down and creating that loop. 
it is a little unorthodox to talk about a loop rather than a grid, but in a downtown where you have a at grade rail dividing the downtown in two, um, looking at a typical grid system is, um, is a bit of a challenge. This is our way of focusing that great experience that Gwen talked about earlier and that Katie talked about on the streets where the people actually are sort of living their local Silver Spring life, moving around the downtown uh, and really turning that diagram of what's Silver Spring about, where are the important places. It's not just about those two main streets that come through. It's actually about what happens in the downtown and the activity along those streets and the experience along those streets, making those streets places that people want to be, where people want to develop along them, employers and employees want to be, uh, really bringing the public realm to a new level uh, on that. That does not preclude, we've made other recommendations throughout the plan about safer crossings of Georgia and Colesville in terms of mid-block protected crossings. We've got numerous of those proposed. We have other improvements proposed in terms of sidewalks and street trees everywhere. Um, but we sort of took the green loop as a system, uh, if you will, it's kind of prioritization of where we think we will get the most bang for the buck of improving this experience and both greening it and making it more environmentally resilient and also making it a more pleasant uh, experience for pets, bikers, even cars. It's always nice to drive along a pleasant street that is green and cool than it is to drive along something that feels like a highway in the middle of downtown. So it really speaks to all the needs of all the people who are in the downtown and focuses on helping make those districts be, seem like special, more special places because they sort of have a special spine that goes through them. It also helps those streets connect in kind of a consistent experience, something that in Silver Spring, um, the districts are all different, but if you have a connecting consistent experience, it really lends to the cohesiveness uh, of the place. So that's sort of the concept on a big picture and how we land it on um, the loop concept rather than a traditional grid. It has a lot to do with the Silver Spring functions and the kinds of um, sort of dividers that they have right now in terms of sort of two major highways and uh, and a rail. As and well, I would just, can I just add that I think the loop is applied on top of the grid. The grid is really, really important and we aren't trying to diminish that at all. Yeah. We're trying to apply on top of that, this special way of traveling through and, you know, connectivity. That was another big, big topic in the plan that we heard a lot during the outreach was this need for connectivity. And the idea of the green loop is to connect the different parts of Silver Spring, all of which, you know, again, are still within a grid. The other thing I do want to emphasize is the green part. We mentioned to you previously, we've gotten a COG grant to study cool streets and cool sidewalks. One of the things that makes people want to walk and bike is if they can walk in a shaded area that is comfortable. And that is a big part of the green loop idea along with the environmental sustainability aspects of it. Sorry to have interrupted, Tara. I'll just, uh, and obviously the, the, the tree canopy is a big piece of this in all redevelopment and certainly one of the biggest complaints that we get and one of the greatest positives we receive when it's done well. Um, I guess you raise the prioritization that the part of the green loop is to prioritize. And I, I still, it's not clear to me the prioritization between street grid improvements, which we need, and intersection improvements, which we need uh, in Silver Spring in particular, uh, and the Green Loop and how that prioritization will interface through the you know, regular process, not just the county uh, budget process, but through the regulatory review process. Uh, so that, that's still, it's still not totally clear to me, but I appreciate the uh, the answer. I don't know if you have a response to that and then I'll yield. I, I see sure, Councilor I think maybe I didn't express question. it so clearly. I'm the loop we propose in the plan that there's sort of three levels to the loop, which Glenn alluded to in his, um, Dr. Orlin, in his discussion, a central loop, an outer loop and connectors. And that in and of itself is a prioritization just within the green loop concept in that the central loop, as far as the green loop concept goes, is the most important. Um, and the outer loop sort of serves a, a more of like a ring road um, situation and connectors are sort of smaller streets. 
that where we would hope to implement as many of the elements as possible. Many of those have a lot smaller right of way. So there would, it would depend on the situation and whether or not there's bike lanes recommended in the master plan as to how to make those connections between the outer loop and the center loop and bring some of the green tactics on those streets into the center. So it's not that it prioritizes versus other things in the plan. It means within that concept, those three elements are a prioritization inside the green loop concept. And if Thanks I can interject, Council Member Friedson, if I understand your question correctly, I think the intersection improvements that are related to LATR, Local Area Transportation Review, will be implemented through the development review process as they have been and they and continue and will continue to be. So I think as Gwen talked about, you know, there's the there's the technical transportation piece, and then there's the more qualitative piece. Uh, okay. Well, I appreciate that. I think, you know, there's still this question of the street grid versus the uh, the green loop. And the, there's the, you know, your argument uh, that I'm hearing is that they're supposed to be complementary uh, to create a greater sense of place and more walkability and, and, and bikeability and, and livability. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I heard the prioritization and I thought it was uh, in reference to the street grid improvements and intersection improvements vis-a-vis uh, -vis the green loop itself. I think what you're saying is you're talking about the green loop within itself uh, having uh, some sense of prioritization. I do think we need to do a better job of prioritizing uh, infrastructure and, and figuring out uh, you know, what is important. We'll I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, but I'll, I'll yield to, to colleagues and I appreciate the clarification there. That's where we're joined Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, this part when we had the, you know, I appreciate planning coming in and briefing, you know, earlier on this. Uh, this was one of the exciting things. I know I could see it and, you know, it's, it's evident today from from Catherine and everybody, you know, just how passionate you all are about this because it is exciting. Um, and I do think it, the concept, while it's bold and would take time and there's a lot of things that would need to be figured out uh, is a good concept uh, for the next evolution of Silver Spring. Um, I remember, you know, uh, being like an eight-year-old, my mom worked on Pershing Drive across the street from the armory, which was like the only public space that was available. It was, it was gray, to your point, Gwen. It was a gray space. It was not a green space. Um, and then you, if you wanted to cross over uh, to uh, Bonifant or Thayer, you had, I cut through like an apartment building and there, there was no good way. If you want to go to Tasty Diner, you had to take your life in your hands to go across Georgia uh, where, you know, and so we've made a lot of improvement, but there, I say that to say, we still are suffering from disconnected, disjointed parts of Silver Spring. And there are great things in Silver Spring, you know, whether it's Fenton Village or, and having something that connects people seamlessly and it's safe uh, and it slows folks down, um, which is, I think, part of the concept, and you have your treescape in the green loop. That is, those are all positive things, um, and I, I do think that um, that we need to go in that type of direction, and it would have a, a dramatic improvement for Silver Spring and make it a unique place, and all those things uh, make it even more of a unique place. I guess my question lies around the, uh, and I appreciate the LATR conversation, and that there's other potential. Uh, funding mechanisms, which we'll talk about later. I look forward to that as well. My question is, is it more, you know, if you put it in, is is the position of planning, like, you know, we, we got to put this bold vision in because then we can incentivize and drive towards it. If we don't, we're saying we don't want it and and we're not going to get it. Is that is that a fair characterization of what I heard? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If it, a plan is not a promise, it doesn't mean we're absolutely going to get it. But if you don't put it in the plan, we can't achieve it. So, I mean, I don't I don't want us to limit ourselves in what we can achieve. I mean, we're seeing um, development activity like we haven't in, in past years. And so we're excited and we want to harness that and we want to make sure that we're leveraging it the most um, strategic way possible to get the results that we're looking for. Yeah, Dr. Orland, I was I was I figured you had a counterpoint to that. Go ahead. You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, actually, a plan is a promise. Um, but what a plan is to say, this is what the future is going to look like. And it has a real impact because, for example, soon following after this plan, there's going to be uh, submitted from DOT at some point, we're told shortly after this plan is approved, a, a Silver Spring um, uh, Urban Mobility Plan, an UMP. 
uh, which is going to look at all the local area improvements, including these improvements here, um, and used as a cost basis for charges on new development. So new development coming in will be paying for this from the get-go, uh, whatever is in the plan. Yeah. So it, it has real it has real implications. I appreciate that. And that is really my core question on here, where I'm going to land on this. I think I like the vision. Good, good. Again, we could all, I'm not a planner, I mean, but we could all have issues with, does this complement the grid enough? Is it, an, you know, but a lot of that's going to have to be figured out as we go. But I do think it's a, it's a bold, good vision. The question of, uh, are we going to put it out there? And then are we going to drive towards it through the ump, through the fizz, and, you know, through everything, through the SIP, you know, whatever, whatever we end up doing. I do think we need to do that. I don't think it's right to put something out there and not drive towards it. And I'm not suggesting that's what we're doing. So maybe I see you have your hand up again, Catherine. You could, you or Gwen speak to that point that Gwen, that Glenn raises, because that's really a key thing for me. If we put it out there, we need to have policies that are going to get us there. Mm -hmm. um, over time, and otherwise it's not, you know, it's, I don't think that's a, the right approach. If I could start just real quickly, I absolutely agree with Dr. Orlin that if we put a vision in a plan, we need to do everything we can to achieve that vision. And Silver Spring actually has been a great example uh, in the 2000 plan of setting out a vision and doing all the things necessary to achieve that vision, including the whole downtown Silver Spring development, the um, civic, the Veterans Plaza and the Civic Building, the library, I mean, all of the things that have happened since the 2000 plan have been driving towards that vision. And it's taken 20 years, but we've accomplished a lot of those items. I would say the green loop is similar. It will not be accomplished overnight. It may take another 20 years, but it is a vision and we should be driving towards it. Luckily, we have lots of tools to do that. We've created this concept of um, urban mobility plans. I, uh, I think Dr. Orlin is optimistic in saying that a urban mobility plan will be completed Soon, we still don't have our urban mobility plan for Bethesda, and that uh, plan was approved in 2017. So, um, you know, I think that it, it is optimistic, although that is still a very good way to uh, get funding for the transportation improvements that are needed. We do have specific development projects coming in at different points along the green loop, and we can, um, you know, use those projects to try to move the ball forward. We also have the off-site uh, LATR um, that may happen before an UMP is created that would give us additional funding opportunities. And it's exactly because of these types of facilities to improve the public realm, to increase the economic competitiveness of Silver Spring. That's exactly why we propose the SIF that we're going to be talking about, to provide not all the money, but additional money to achieve those important connectivity and infrastructure projects. That That's what the SIF stands for, connectivity and infrastructure. And there's nothing that I think reflects that more than the green loop, perhaps the bridge over the tracks, but also the green loop. Um, so I, I think we have some funding sources. Ms. Uh, yes, Catherine. Yeah, hi. Um, so everything that Gwen, um, Director Wright said is is right on. We are already um, enforcing our vision of what is in the bicycle master plan um, through LATR improvements. That's just one project. We have more in the pipeline that we are expecting. So um, I think that it's really, really important that we don't walk this backwards. That's my biggest concern. Right now, the bicycle master plan says that for business district streets such as Cameron, we should be looking for separated bike lanes. And that's in fact what's in the bicycle master plan for this specific street. So, uh, and we also, I 
want to remind us that we have Vision Zero and several of our policies that are focusing on safety, which emphasize separation, especially in these dense urban environments. So this, I, I, I appreciate that you, you commented that on our passion, because that is exactly what we have for this. Um, we were going in the right direction in 2018. I don't want to go backwards. This, we, we would be going against what is considered best practices and what our vision is both for this plan, but also countywide. So. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I, Dr. Roland has a hand up, you know, but then you can, I can, I'll just say to close out, I, I appreciate it. I, I, you know, I'd like to find a way. I think I heard you, Mr. Chairman, saying that you, we'd like to keep it in. I, I think we should. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we can have the discussions again with the big, big caveat. <laughs> we, it, you already have some tools at your disposal in planning, but we should make sure there's more so that we can actually achieve it over time. So I'll turn it back to, to you if Dr. Earl wants to say something, but back to you, Mr. Chairman, after that. Well, I, I, okay. I wanted to just ask a question also that goes back to Dr. Orland here, because Glenn, you said that all of this infrastructure gets rolled up into the UMP and then the per trip fee is based on that. Okay. We have a major problem here. We have received a plan from planning that does not really seem to contemplate the UMP model. And you've proposed your own UMP model, essentially. You know, you've proposed a set of infrastructure that you want to charge for through the density system. And it's creating an issue because we've got existing processes and policies in place to fund infrastructure, like our capital budget and our LATR charges and the expected UMP. And so that's for a later section in the packet here. But I am a little worried if all of these ideas would get rolled up into that charge, because as Glenn said from the beginning, the amount of infrastructure that you've recommended is really significant. And, you know, acknowledging that Silver Spring needs trans transformational infrastructure. But if the cost of it all stacks up and up and up, and then that cost gets integrated into the development process, we need to be able to distinguish from what it is that we are going to start charging development for right away um, and what might be appropriate really just to fund with the county's capital budget, as we're doing today with the Silver Spring Circle, for example, the protected bike loop. And so I'm, I, we need to, we're going to, obviously, this is the issue we're going to have to resolve here, but I'm a little worried about what I'm now learning here as to how this infrastructure gets paid for, because I think in planning, in vision, vision, you know, we would collect funds towards it. I don't know that anybody suggested there would be enough funds from development to pay for it, you know. I mean, this is very expensive stuff. So the county capital budget would have to be devoted to this. So I think we all have to, you know, recognize that the way to pay for this is truly still going to be the same way we pay for everything, which is with the capital budget. Um, so we need to be able to distinguish between these. So Glenn. Yeah, just, just actually, I was just following up on a relatively minor point. Um, uh, first of all, I share Director Wright's uh, uh, frustration about the Bethesda. Um, uh, it really should have been done four years ago. And I want to <laughs> just pause on that really quick because it is important to note that MCDOT is still charging for transportation infrastructure. They're just using LATR to do it. So the absence of the UMP doesn't necessarily mean that we aren't charging. It's just that it's a different way of doing it. That's right, Glenn? Correct, but the amount of money we're collecting for that is much less than what it would be for the UMP, much less. The um, but what, my point is that um, we could Hannah Hand and and uh, Andrew Boss here on this call. Uh, I did read somewhere that uh, the intent was to send over a draft or the executive's recommendation on a Silver Spring UMP shortly after the plan. Maybe they can fill us in as to when that would come. Hello, Hannah. Hi. Um, I'd welcome Andrew to speak to this, but we have, as has been mentioned uh, regarding Bethesda, the Bethesda UMP is not in place. 
um, and one of the lessons learned about the Bethesda process was that how important it is to have the UMP in place as soon as possible so that this development over time does not reduce the potential for raising um, funding for these projects. So as our lesson learned from that, our intent is to have the Silver Spring UMP ready to go as soon as possible so that that is not repeated. And so, Andrew, okay, do you want to speak more I, specifically? Please do, but I want to ask, as you do, please answer. Are you able to select a set of projects that go into the UMP, or are you required to just use everything that is laid out in the master plan? Can I answer that? Uh, I mean, Glenn, it, yeah, go ahead. It, 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 it's for local area improvements. So, for example, any BRT improvements within Silver Spring uh, would not be part of the cost uh, of an up. Um, but for the local ped bike improvements, yes, they would be. And the street reconstructions would be. Um, and I think in Silver Spring, it's going to be complicated because umps are supposed to be for improvements to urban mobility. Including and, bike, bike and pet, right. Including bike and pet. But there's, you know, like some question, for example, the bridge over the tracks. Yes, that has some, you know, improvements for pedestrians, but is it really an essential part of the transportation infrastructure for downtown Silver Spring that should be included in the UMP? Or is it sort of a separate special project? Those kinds of things I think will have to be discussed, and we really haven't had those discussions yet. I agree. That's a great area. Do you have all right? So the first question is: Does the master plan set of projects is it an obligation that those all go into the UMP? And if not, good, we can sort through what actually is in there, and then you know have a set of projects that are reasonably affordable so that as we're charging for them across all the development, we'll actually be able to raise some money. I mean, you know. Can I, can I we, jump in if, on this? Uh, yes, just one second. You know, if we load up all of these projects and then projects, you know, nothing can move forward, then we get nothing. You know, so we got to find that balance where we're charging what we can charge in order to actually get benefits instead of having plans that look great on paper and never produce any actual benefits. Um, that's the, that's the, you know, challenge here. Okay. So Casey would like to weigh in. Andrew Bossy is going to comment from MCDOT's perspective further about the ump and then council member Friedson's hand is up. Glenn, you're still, your hand is still up. You can weigh in as you, you know, so Casey and then Andrew. I, I just have to point out, none of, the, I, I was there at the founding, as far as the umps are concerned. It was about White Oak. And I can tell you that this, it's not like this is handed down on stone tablets where somebody says all transportation related anything has to be rolled into the ump. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, you that's say, great. No, we've established that now. So, we, we, you know, yeah. I don't know that that was clear 20 minutes ago, at least for us here in the conversation. So, yeah. And I mean, the, the bridge over the tracks and the green loop. Yeah, they do have transportation dimensions to them, but it's really about more than it's about placemaking. It's about quality of place. And there's no reason you can't do some of that through the regular development review process, yeah. some of it through the op and some through the capital budget. And preferably, Absolutely. we think through some sort of SIP. But so as, is, as a follow up, a, as a yeah. follow up, you know, MCDOT will send us an op and they will have a list of projects. And then we will all see that, and that will be a council adopted list of projects, I think. So planning and MCDOT will have a lot of conversation about what actually goes into the UMP. And then that's how we're going to sort this out. So our work, you know, will just begin after we adopt this plan here. Okay, I'm a little clearer on this. Thank you. Andrew Friedson and then Andrew Bossy. Or if Andrew Friedson wants to. Yeah, I'll let Andrew Bossy go first, and then I'll uh, right. ask a question. I was just going to say exactly what Casey said, so uh, I don't have much more to add to that. Add to that. Okay. 
Well, I, I appreciate. Well, first of all, I'm glad the clarification. I was going to note uh, the White Oak example because there was a discussion and it was somewhat subjective of what was included and what wasn't. And this balance of building the infrastructure but making sure that the payments are reasonable so that it doesn't preempt uh, redevelopment from uh, occurring. And there is a balance uh, that 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 takes place with that. The, the challenge in Bethesda is that, of course, it's taken so long and so now the numerator and denominators are out of whack and the cost is prohibitive and unfair uh, because you're asking you know the the straw that breaks the camel's back so to speak to uh to cover the payment uh for everybody uh which is not the intention of how umps are supposed to work i'm just curious and, and wondering you know we said well we haven't had that discussion yet and you know we're we're talking here about uh, the fact that there's a commitment to move forward with the list and have that discussion as a practice, shouldn't we do this together? Like, sh shouldn't the, 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 um, projects and the agreement of what that looks like and the amount of square footage that we, you know, uh, think is, is plausible and ultimately then the, the, the cost, uh, and, and charges, uh, that are going to this. I mean, shouldn't these be put on parallel tracks? It just seems a little bit odd and it's not just for this plan. I'm just, Curious, this is going to be an issue in every urban area that we do a master plan for moving forward. And I'm just curious why we don't set it up in a way where we ensure that an ump is going to be put in place at the time at which the master plan becomes effective. Because if we don't do that, the chances that it might not happen. And if it doesn't happen, then we end up with the same challenges uh, we're here discussing, which just seems like we're setting ourselves up uh, in, in certain regards uh, to come short of success, which doesn't seem like the, the best approach. So just just wondering if someone could answer that question for me and uh, not just with this particular plan, but uh, with uh, plans in general. I can try. Um, what happened with White Oak is because it was a new uh, idea at the time. Uh, once the plan was adopted, um, the DOT had asked at that same time the plan was adopted for money to actually hire a consultant and work on the what became the local area transportation improvement program, which is the first OMP. Um, and so it took about a year to go through that process, and, and costing out all of the infrastructure that was local area transportation improvements. That point, it took an hour. Took it came a year later, uh, and it's and on the Bethesda, one, it's not like they haven't been working on it. I remember. I think maybe three years ago, they had a draft that was ready, but it was brought to the developers and the developers basically said, this is this is outrageous that we, we can't possibly pay this. You need to go back to the drawing boards. There's been that's a lot of work that's been done over the years by DOT on this. Yes, uh, uh, the best thing would be if, if DOT, while the plan is being developed, also works on what the ump costs would be, and there's some communication uh, between DOT and park and planning as that's all happening. So at the end of the day, when a plan comes over, there is a fairly good idea, at least what the UMP would be based on the draft plan. Now, of course, the council's going to make changes that would change in the UMP as well. That would be the best situation. Um, but it is a lot of work on DOT's part coming up with these cost estimates and, and, and figuring the stuff out. So, uh, what, Mr. Friedson, what you're saying is it would be the goal, um, to do that but it's, it's, we're not there yet. The only other point that I would make is um, we've put a lot of, um, we're, we, we, we're putting a lot of, uh, of um, I don't know what the word is, burdens <laughs> is the word I'm thinking of, on plans. Plans are promises but they're also visionary. They are not at the le detailed level of doing facility planning for individual transportation projects. They are, um, you know, a broad vision. To do an ump, you need to get to another level of detail in terms of understanding the costs of specific projects. Traditionally, we have not done facility planning for all of the ideas mentioned in a plan, transportation or otherwise. And so I think 
that the white oak model in a way was a good, I think a good model in that the plan was done and then there was a consultant effort to do much, much more detailed cost estimating and facility, sort of facility planning for certain improvements to make sure that the cost estimates were realistic. And then you could come up with the formula to do the ump. But, you know, it's very, very hard to actually develop accurate cost estimates on some of the broad concepts laid out in master plans. Appreciate that. I mean, I, I think master plans should be aspirational, but they also should be achievable. And I do think that if we're going to reference the UMP, and if that's part of the conversation, that there is a bit of a, a disconnect here. And I, I do think that there are some uh, challenges with then trying to come up with, we haven't quite gotten the ump system right, and we're coming up with other mechanisms too. And so I do think we got to figure out a way uh, to actually, you know, parallel the tracks uh, quite a bit, or we should be honest that uh, um, the ump is hard to achieve based on the timeline that we've set forth for all the reasons, Gwen, that you just said, I mean, which makes total sense to me. I mean, I understand you can't come up with a cost estimate for something that hasn't gone through facilities uh, planning. That's that you know that's you know fully realistic. And so perhaps the the timelines here you know, don't quite work out to the extent that we would uh, want them or, or 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 need them. But anyway, I, I think uh, this is an overarching question. I don't want to hold it up. I think maybe this is the reason and the challenge why what I had suggested doesn't work. That if we waited for umps. Uh, to be fully implemented. We might be waiting for every master plan in every urban area for far longer than any of us would be comfortable. But I do think it's a, a challenge that we've got to work out and we've got to figure out. And I'm not sure that we have the answer uh, you know, up, up to this point. I think we just have to be you know, honest uh, with each other and, and, and with the public uh, about that. And I, you know, I think this conversation at least has been, so I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, this is uh, very technical, but it seems to me that we ought to have a general sense of how much we think we can charge and then select a, a fee that corresponds to that based on a general idea of a certain number of projects that correspond to that. I don't know how much more you can do than that, but uh, Hannah? Yes, you're, you're on the right track there. I think oh. that you could set an interim ombre pending a more precise analysis. Just pick a number. It has to be defensible, but it doesn't have to be that precise. And that could make these umps work. And then you could still refine the list of projects and the cost estimates, and you could revise it over time. But instead, we've waited for years and years. And I think that makes the umps unworkable. But it's in principle, Councilman Rumor, I think what you said is right on the mark. P try to come up with a relatively rough estimate and start implementing it, that gives you the basis to start collecting a fee because the point of the op was to make sure you didn't have this musical chairs problem where the person who's trying to develop right next to an intersection or something that needed to be fixed had to bear the whole cost. You can achieve that by coming up with a rough estimate of what the pool of projects is and what their cost is, and that achieves the goal of a proportionate payment. That's the key point about the ops. But that's ump reform for maybe another conversation. Anna? Um, in thank you. In response to Chair Anderson, I I in principle, I think DOT would support the the concept of initiating a temporary fee while the final fee is to is determined. We would encourage that temporary fee rate to be conservative um, so that it is, you know, being easier to reduce a fee and provide some sort of uh, refund versus increasing a fee if we find that it needs to be higher. Um, I do want to share that uh, while a temporary fee may need to be considered, that it's my understanding that our 
our Silver Spring UMP is nearly complete. Apparently there's just one final conceptual detail that our staff is working out with planning regarding trip generation. And, but it is fully drafted pending that one um, point of clarification. And how much does it correspond to the projects that we're adopting through this master plan? Um, Andrew, would you like to speak to that? My understanding is that it's it's based on this master plan, the projects in this master plan, and would be up for your review um, for for final determination of what's included. But Andrew, right, it's taking the projects proposed by the plan, kind of making an initial pitch of which projects should be in the UMP. Um, as we mentioned, the some of the major capital projects like the BRT and possibly the bridges or the connectors across the railroad tracks, maybe they wouldn't be included. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not being built. It just means they're not part of that funding program. Um, but ultimately, that selection of projects when it comes to council, just like in White Oak, um, council can choose what is in, what is out. Um, there's, you'll have the full list of master plan projects, but you can pick and choose what's actually in the program. Okay. So this has been proceeding in a way that we would like. Okay. Um, All right, back to where we are. Andrew Friedson, did you have your hand up additionally, or is that uh, remaining from, from previous? Sorry, right. I was from earlier. All Mr. right, so we're on the question of, oh, yes. Council no, go ahead. You, that was just going to say if we could. Yeah, move we're, 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 we're really talking about the bigger issue of, you know, how we fund transportation through the project here. Um, but we're specifically in the question of the green streets. And, um, so, uh, you know, anything else on this Green Street question? I, my, I would like to have those projects remain in the plan. And I, I suppose we can ask Andrew Bossi, are, are any of them part of your ump? Um, that might be telling as to, you know, how we will actually be proceeding. So, Andrew. At this stage, yeah, the, the bikeways are all included in what I'm drawing up at this point. All of the bikeways, so all the green streets. Right. Uh, there are some that, uh, as as Glenda pointed out, that I don't have estimates for just from a lack of clear detail. There weren't many, but a couple of the connectors um, didn't necessarily call for a type of bikeway, so I didn't have much more to assign a cost for that. Okay. Glenn, any last comments here? Um, on, on Cameron Street, it looks like the committee is unanimous in going with the final draft plan in terms of calling for the cross section it's, uh, it's in the plan right so it's we can, uh, yeah i think you will express that okay so the, the next uh, the next items are the other bikeways and they're not in the green streets i mean they're not part of the green loop okay um and but they're all local and local streets and i have some many of the same kind of comments so for example uh silver spring avenue between george avenue and fenton street um uh, it's currently a 40 foot wide business district street with a 60 foot right of way. Um, the uh, Silver Spring plan recommends the street be rebuilt with one way separated bike lanes on each side. It recommends removing the on street parking on the south side of the block, including um, uh, planted buffers between the bike lanes and the street, um, in, um, along with eight foot wide sidewalks on both sides, which require a 70 foot right of way th um, throughout which presupposes that much of the block will be redeveloped. Uh, and it's in figure 31 of the plan. Um, uh, again, this is a street that has very little uh, traffic, very low volume. Um, and the bicycle master plan does not call for uh, separated bike lanes on this sections on, on this block. Uh, my recommendation is to uh, agree with the bicycle master plan that this block be referred to as a shared street, uh, which is one that basically has uh, uh, biking in the, street, in the street, along with cars. Uh, it's signed and marked to, to drivers to watch out for pedestrians, for watch out for bikers. Um, okay, so it sounds like that would be a step back from our bike master plan. So- uh, No, it's the same. You have it's, the same it's the same as the bike master plan. Oh, you're saying it's the same as the bike. Same, master plan. But, yeah. 
I think there's an important distinction that needs to be made. I appreciate what Dr. Orland is saying that right now the bicycle master plan, which was developed in 2018, shows shared roadway on those streets. However, the methodology that is promoted by the bicycle master plan is such that business district streets, especially those that we have identified as main streets for those districts, should have separation. So I appreciate that confusion, but we're further clarifying that in this sector plan. And that was actually an understanding of the bicycle master plan, which was done countywide all at once that each sector plan would further refine the bicycle recommendations. And that's what we're doing here. All right. I'm in favor of leaving the bikeways in the plan throughout the plan. Um, and we have a number of these up ahead of us here. Um, so let's uh, proceed here. We're on Silver Spring Avenue. Any comments from colleagues on Silver Spring Avenue, Andrew Friedson. Yeah, so I appreciate uh, the clarification about the methodology. You know, I, I do think consistency with the bike master, what we just approved, I mean, four years is not a very long time for a functional master plan. We've barely begun to implement it. We have a very, very long way to go uh, before we even come close uh, to it. So I, I do have a little bit of heartburn to be honest, of, uh, you know, really adding on to the priorities that we haven't even begun to kind of scratch the surface uh, of, but I, I understand why and, and, and the rationale. So I'm just wondering if, if we're going to go in the direction of including everything, uh, you know, one, it relates to the ump conversation of if we're including everything and it goes well beyond the 2018 Mash plan, which was extremely expensive to implement, um, we need to be realistic of what we actually think is going uh, to happen. Uh, uh, and, you know, I think we need to prioritize it. And, and, and I don't know what that prioritization uh, is or should be. I think we need DOT and planning to help make that determination. But uh, we do need some level of prioritization that, um, you know, the, the, the the bike mash plan did have, you know, in terms of tiers, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly how we do that here, particularly if we're adding on to things that were not in the bike master plan. Uh, you know, it's harder to say, you know, we're going to include all tier one, for instance, if certain things that we're going to be approving here, were not uh, in the, the bike master plan. So I'd love to hear, you know, if, if the direction that the, the committee is going to be taking is to keep everything in, um, including those aspects that were not part of the 2018 bike master plan, then uh, how or if we're gonna prioritize uh, these projects to determine what we move forward and when, uh, and, 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 and you know, how much they're realistically gonna cost and how we're gonna pay for them because you know, that is one of the challenges now that we're talking about. This isn't just aspirational. If we're going to include it in the umps, and the umps are part of what we're charging for redevelopment, and the main goal of the plan is uh, to see a vibrant uh, level of redevelopment in downtown Silver Spring and to have the, uh, the, 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 the second tranche of renaissance, so to speak, uh, that we've seen in, in the success of, of, of Silver Spring, then we, we've got to figure that out. So um, I will reserve judgment on whether or not we should go beyond the 2018 uh, master plan uh, here until I have a better understanding of, you know, how or if we're going to prioritize individual projects uh, that are included and you know, what's the mechanism uh, to actually build them out, because I think it matters, particularly in the context of the prior conversation that we were having. Okay. Um... Okay, well, uh, you know, I think what we're hearing is that there's going to be a process ahead of us to prioritize all these pieces of infrastructure. And, um, you know, they're working on a draft now. And ultimately, we're going to have to make a decision as to what we think is affordable. I guess that's a regulatory process. Um, but it has feed, stakeholder feedback. Do we set the ump fee, Glenn, by, by resolution, or is that through regulation? Well, by resolution. Um, what happens is the executive sends over a proposal for the list of projects that would be in the ump and the costs. 
uh, and also uh, sends over information about the, the ex derived from the master plan as to how much remaining development there is, and that results in a per trip cost. So what the council will be approving is a resolution which has the list of projects, the total cost, and the per trip cost. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that every two years, excuse me, uh, any up is supposed to be updated by the CPI in terms of the cost well, that cost basis, so that the rate would go up by the seat by the construction cost index. Um, and then in the sixth year after it's approved, there's supposed to be a total reevaluation of the UMP fee, looking at what remaining development is at that point, what the remaining uh, roads, or I'm sorry, transportation improvements there are at that point in the plan, and calculating a different fee. Uh, okay. So there is, a, there is a process built into the um, into the, uh, I believe uh, it, it's either in the GNI plan or elsewhere. I don't recall where. Okay, um, but Glenn, when you started off with your transportation segment, you mentioned that generally speaking, this plan has a level of infrastructure that is highly unusual. You know, it's got like triple the cost than you know we normally have had. Uh, on that, you know, we've removed some of that, but I'm assuming that the ump that we'll receive will have essentially like phase one and phase two or something. I mean, I, I, I don't know. We, well, we've heard that there's a process to determine what's going to be in the ump. And guess, yeah, there, there's, there are a lot of questions that we'll have to deal with when it comes over. And, and I mean, um, you uh, can only build so many projects at a time. Like, you well, know, so yeah, but again, if the denominator is the total development, if you only divide it, if, if you're going to take a fewer projects, do you start with the fewer development a denominator, in which case you end up with a rate almost as big. Uh, I'm not sure, sure if there's a way you can do this without looking at the total you know, cost of the UMP program over time divided by the total remaining development. Otherwise, we're not sort of treating everybody equally. But there are projects which are in the gray area. And, 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 and Director Wright, I think the point I'm making bridge. is that the cost of the projects exceeds the ability of the private sector to pay. <laughs> and we're going to have to make some adjustment here. So we will either just get a fee that is the fee that we think is affordable and we'll allocate that as we prioritize the projects. I mean, I, I don't see any, any alternative to that. I don't see any alternative to that because the amount of projects vastly exceeds what is normal. We're not, we can't just charge towards a, you know, amped up list of projects. So we're going to have to set a fee that we think is you know, what we can charge reasonably, and then we're going to have to allocate it to the projects as we go. Well, that sounds yeah. like, but go ahead. We have to talk about the UMP um, offline with yeah. both transportation staff and council yeah. staff. Okay. Having been there at the beginning of the UMPs, I will emphasize that the goal of the UMPs was to replace LATR right. and was to focus on transportation improvements, including pet and bike, that were absolutely needed right. to meet the transportation goals and needs of an area. Right. Adding trees to a bike lane is not related to the transportation need of having a bike lane. Right. It is an improvement for the public realm. So I think we have to, with the Silver Spring UMP, separate out the costs of building the basic bike lanes versus some of what I'll call enhancements that we're describing for the Green Loop. What all of the development in the area should pay for is for the basic transportation needs to make it possible for people to get around. And then if there are additional improvements or enhancements, like the bridge over the CSX tracks, or like additional greening of the bike lanes, which is what we're talking about with the green loop, then that might be in a separate pot that's not part of the UMP, but that could be part of other funding strategies. Okay. But to be perfectly honest, although I understand from DOT that they've been talking to people on my staff about the Silver Spring UMP, I have heard nothing. I've not been briefed. I know nothing about what those discussions have been. And so now that I understand that that's happening, we're going to, I'm personally going to dive in 
and find out what those conversations have been because I think it needs a very nuanced discussion. Okay, that's helpful. All right, again, uh, you know, I, I recommend we just keep the bike infrastructure that's been planned here. Uh, Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we should decide whether we ought to wait for the ump conversation and pick and choose what we think is necessary which, versus what we think is enhancing uh, then or whether we prioritize it in the master plan. And, you know, I think, you know, you're talking about the difference between you know, mobil you know, needed mobility improvements versus, uh, you know, recommendations for enhancements that improve quality of life, that make things more livable, that, that, that create a sense of, of, of place. And, you know, I understand the distinction that is being addressed, but we're not noting that at all, it seems, in the master plan. We're treating them all effectively equally. Well, and I just think that that lack of prioritization is a challenge and it's going to make it harder when we have the ump conversation. So it just se seems, I mean, deciding exactly what's in, exactly what the fees are, exactly how it works. I mean, I understand that that, you know, we don't want to hold up this process in order to have that process. I think they probably should be parallel tracks, but I get that's not how things are, are, are working and I don't want to slow this down, but um, it, it just seems odd to me that we would say we're going to prioritize, but we're going to prioritize later. And the document that we are approving now, which sets the entire process in motion, doesn't prioritize at all unless I'm missing something. So well, I, maybe we can come up with some language with Dr. Orlin that sort of makes that distinction between um, transportation necessities that are required and that those should be funded through the UMP and transportation enhancements that could be funded through other sources. And those other sources, again, we'll be talking about the connectivity and infrastructure fund, but it also could just be a um, capital budget. I mean, when we did the Veterans Plaza in Silver Spring, many of you may remember that you know, an open space that was uh, AstroTurf existed in that location and was much beloved for many, many, many years. And it was open space, but we made a choice to build a much, much more highly designed, highly amenitized plaza. And I think that that was a good choice because that plaza is heavily used and has become the, the center of activity in that portion of Silver Spring. But that was not um, costed out during the master plan of how much a delta there was between an AstroTurf open space and a highly amenitized designed plaza. It was a decision that was made as we progressed through implementation of the plan and the council was very involved in making the decisions about what Veterans Plaza would end up, you know, looking like and, and whether any, and whether government funds were used to implement that. So I guess my, my point with the transportation features is maybe we need in the plan to have some language about necessities versus enhancements. I think, I think that could be a useful clarification, helping to express to people who read the plan um, how we are looking at this. You know, my view of these street designs is you're taking a long-term goal of how do we want the streets in Silver Spring? What's the experience that we want for people? And it, it's going to take some a long time to get there. And as you said, a piece of that is transportation capacity. A piece of that is just livability and, and mode shift. And so I think it's important to keep that vision in the plan. And, you know, uh, we do have much more immediate needs for replacing cracked and broken and dangerous sidewalks, as has been said. You know, we have to proceed one step at a time. 
but uh, okay, we've got to keep moving here. So we'll get some more language that helps clarify that. So I guess the question is, uh, Mr. Reamer, you mentioned that for, I guess for all five of these segments, you would go with plan in the section number two. Um, I haven't heard yet from Mr. Fritz and Mr. Juwando. Uh, we haven't talked about the other four yet, but uh, if you want to take them all up at the same time. Basically, my, my point is that uh, on, for most of these other ones, which are, again, local streets, um, either going with just with a shared street or, in one case, a conventional bike lane is enough. Uh, but uh, Mr. Ringer said he agrees with the plan on all, all five of these elements, uh, segments, and uh, just need to get you guys on the record for for um, so we have a committee recommendation. Let's see when we go through them individually. I've well, talked quite a bit, so I'll yield to Council Member Juwanda, but I have a quick question for planning after that. Sure. All right. I, I appreciate the, the, the shared spotlight about the shared streets. <laughs> um, you know, I think, look, we all want the goal, the, the bike master plan is, you know, and I know Councilman uh, Reamer, uh, you know, I haven't seen the, uh, the bike uh, lapel pin in a while, but, you know, I used to enjoy it uh, when we, you know, looking at it. I'm sure he still has it. Um, and so it's an important uh, component of our work and move towards better, uh, more complete streets. And so, but I do think these, the questions Councilman Friesen brings up and this discussion about language and prioritization and what that's going to mean, I think, you know, this is all kind of mixed together. It's, it's hard to say, yeah, of course we all want to improve pedestrian and bike safety, you know, in this case, bike, bike safety and want to add additional capacity and, and better mobility for bicyclists, but I, I just, you know, I, so I almost want, I almost wonder if it's possible to see that link, you know, get that recommendation back before we, you know, have to make a final decision here on this, uh, on whether to adopt a plan language or not, uh, you know, so I, that's kind of where I am at this moment. Well, we can certainly, uh, get some additional language. Um, you know, I, 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 I I'll say it's not just bikes. This is really about what's the street design. You know, what do the streets look like? It's not really so much bike infrastructure. It includes bike infrastructure, but what yeah. they're charting out for us is a very different vision of how the streets should look and feel. And it's, you know, anyway. I'm not sure if, excuse me, I'm not sure if language is going to help here. I mean, the, the prioritization is different than the plan itself. The plan says this is what we want to have at the end. Yeah. And I think you need to make a decision on that. Uh, the prioritization and how it's funded, we had a good discussion about that, but th those are those are somewhat later steps, maybe not too far later, but after the plan. So, I mean, I, I just encourage, I mean, Mr. Reamer has been clear. He agrees with the uh, what the plan is recommending for these five road segments. Uh, and to get a, I, I can go through the other ones real quick, or you can just take a vote on each one individually. Uh, you decided. Could I just, could I just ask, because I, I, I have been, probably been equally as unclear as Councilmember Chuando, uh, because, you know, I, I, I think it's a little bit tough here, honestly. But, uh, on the first item, uh, Katie, you explained why there is a discrepancy between the bike master plan and what is recommended here. Perhaps, Dr. Owen, if it's okay with you, I, I understand really what you're recommending and why it's a matter of cost and benefit, really. I mean, you've looked at it and said, what is the traffic volume here? What is the, you know, dynamic? Was it in the, you know, 2018 bike plan? Those are kind of the factors that you looked at and you made, you know, recommendations that I think are, are helpful. It would be helpful for me, I mean, to understand on the other four recommendations from planning, if that would be okay, of what the reason for the discrepancy would be, and that would help me at least, and perhaps Council Member Jawando, to have a better understanding of, uh, you know, the, the the difference. And then, um, you know, either way, I think the prioritization I'm going to be pushing for, but I think that would be helpful for me at least to to determine where I am before we exit this conversation. Okay, so um, are you asking for the rationale between like why we were recommending the separated bike lanes and the full? Yeah, if you could just go through the other totally four fine. items, you know, you know, one by one, and just quickly explain, 
you know, here's what the, you know, here's the discrepancy of why it might be different, or, you know, here's why we feel strongly that uh, Dr. Orland's shared street recommendation is not, uh, you know, uh, reflective of the goals of the plan. And, and, and you know, here, here's, here's why. For the first item you explain, you think it is consistent with the 2018 bike crash plan, even though it isn't specifically called out because this plan is, uh, you know, basically changing the type of corridor uh, that uh, is, is reflected. That's your argument. Uh, and, uh, you know, I appreciate that. Um, you know, if you could just explain for the other items, I think that would be helpful. Sure, I'll get that started. I'm also going to tag uh, my colleague, David Onsbacher here. I think it would be helpful since he also worked on the bicycle master plan and was integral in us building out the bike network for the Silver Spring uh, and adjacent community sector plan. So Silver Spring Avenue is a very important east-west connection. It brings you over to the Capitol Crescent Trail as well as uh, to the Purple Line Station. That's going to be a major east-west connection that is not Wayne Avenue. So we want to make sure that we have multiple opportunities to be able to build out the bicycle grid. That one is very important. Uh, Blair Mill Road is going to be taking you from Eastern Avenue to East West Highway. That was another one of part of the Green, green Loop. This is also um, an area where we expect that there may be some redevelopment, but there's going to be high de uh, demand for a separated facility for cyclists because pedestrians are also going to be um, a big way of getting around here. Let's see. And then on the other ones that were mentioned. 13th Street. 13th Street. 13th Street, we actually have seen um, a concept plan for a major mixed-use development on that site, and we've even been talking with the developer about that specific cross-section. That's actually where that discussion came about in the first place. Um, that has a very wide street today that actually will make it easier to build into from the existing curb network so we can actually keep the trees that are there today. So that's probably going to be one of the easier ones to implement if that's one of the questions that you have. And then, uh, Dr. Orland, what uh, first street is, uh, is the last one? First okay, Street Avenue between Spring Street and Fenwick. And then First Street Extended, I think they're important to talk about together. Okay, great. So First Street, let us I would actually like to talk about First Street Extended first because that's how we came up with this recommendation. So First Street Extended is um, a street that, to your point, uh, Council Member Friedson was talking about rebuilding the grid. We tried to find opportunities where we might be able to expand the grid of the network. Um, and so redevelopment of that garage would be able to get us a connection in between Spring Street, which is a major bicycle connection and bicycle and pedestrian connection, and Cameron Street, as I've talked about extensively, being another main street that's another important east-west connection. So assuming that we were going to connect those two major bicycle facilities, we would want to make sure that we had the appropriate facilities on that roadway. Now, assuming that that happens, first Street between Spring Street and um, Fenwick, that would then be um, a missing connection. And so we tried to be conservative in our approach there, but still looking for separated bike lanes in that um, corridor. And so that is why we are making that connection with those two roadways. Um, Mr. Osbacher, was there anything that I missed on that? No, I, I think you largely covered it. I'd say uh, just in summary, all of this is about creating a low stress bicycling network. Uh, as part of the bicycle master plan, as part of the growth and infrastructure policy, you have approved a methodology uh, for evaluating level of traffic stress. We worked with DOT uh, very hard on that. I think there's general agreement about that process. Um, the bike plan took a broad approach because it was a countywide plan uh, with the understanding that um, you know, local area master plans have the opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to look at a more deep, deeper level where you know maybe trade-offs are are warranted, and so that's what the Silver Spring Plan is doing. I'd also say that as part of the growth and infrastructure policy, or approved right after the growth and infrastructure policy was approved, you um, you supported the low stress bicycling metric, and that has allowed us to look at these areas in a more fine-grained uh, way. What we find is that low stress bicycling is a lot lower in our downtown areas uh, than it would be in the rest of the county. And so that tells us that there is a need for some additional recommendations. And that what is what the Silver Spring downtown and adjacent communities plan has brought forth to you. Are there any questions about that? Is there anything that's unclear? Yes, yeah, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So you're saying that, um, you know, besides arguing individually for the, these different stretches and why mm -hmm. you believe that they're important to fulfill, uh, uh, you know, priorities for, for, for bike ability and, and, and mobility, um, that the analytical tool 
that we approved, which, you know, basically followed, but, you know, is consistent with the 2018 bike master plan is where this is being argued. Not necessarily the 2018 bike master plan itself. I mean, I'll just, the first item here was a lot clearer for you to explain, you know, here's why it wasn't listed in the bike master plan. Here's the change that we're making in this plan. Here's why that makes it consistent with the 2018 bike master plan. And all of these are business district streets as well. So if that helps. Okay. So your argument is the same for these other items too. And as a point of clarity, there are other business district streets in the sector plan that we've not recommend. So we have taken a fine look to make sure that we're, we're really identifying the key connections that we want to have these separated bike lanes on. And also just, sorry, I know I'm jumping around, but the 13th street bikeway does have a current recommendation in the bicycle master plan to be separated as well. So it's really only a few of these are different from what is mapped in the bicycle master plan, but they all take that approach and methodology that is consistent on page 71 of the bicycle master plan, as well as the complete streets design guidelines and other policies that we've been implementing to try to get the most complete network that we can. And if I can add this, these analytical tools allow us this is prioritization. We are prioritizing where the bikeways should go. As, as Katie just said, there's a lot of streets that still don't have bikeways. So the plan is helping to elevate those. And the way we do that is we can look through our analytical tools. We can look at each origin and each destination and determine which connections, if we make them with low stress bicycling, add to the bicycling network in the greatest way. So we are have very fine grain analytical capabilities that allow us, you know, street by street, block by block, origin destination pair by origin destination pair to figure out what is most needed. And that's what is here. I appreciate it. Well, yeah, I'll yield to the council member, Joanna. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, that is helpful. Um, you know, so it sounds like you, you did some prioritization. <laughs> already is kind of what I heard there as far as what you decided and that there's not as much over and above the original bike master plan uh, as as well. Um, you know, so I think I'd be fine then, you know, leaving, leaving the plan as is um, considering that back and forth. So I appreciate it. I'm comfortable with that too, but I just, still very strongly think that we need uh you know the prioritization language and uh you know discussion in the plan itself as we discussed earlier so i don't want to lose that piece of this even if we move forward and say we're going to keep it uh, as is i think it you know that that to me that's that's my condition of approval so to speak at least for my vote okay well we're going to need some language pretty soon uh, I think we're coming back on Thursday, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, possibly that'll be our final committee session, um, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. Thank you, Glenn. One more item, um, schools. Um, school adequacy is something that's looked at in every plan. The short of it is we're fine. <laughs> Uh, basically, if you look at the uh, 11,000 high-rise um, units, which are called for in the plan, and that would generate 374 more elementary school students, 165 more middle school students, and 176 more high school students than what the plan currently calls for. When you, uh, when you look at uh, the uh, longer-term forecast for the school system and where uh, capacity is already being programmed or uh, to be added, uh, we'll find that um, at the high school level, we're, we're okay because the additions to Northwood and the reopening of Woodward. Uh, at the middle school level, we're fine. Uh, the only place where we don't have enough capacity is the elementary school level, but there exists some closed schools in the area which could be plausibly reopened uh, in time for the 11,000 units, all of them to be uh, generating students and again. Uh, the most obvious one being Parkside. Um, since it's uh, now vacant and uh, it doesn't have a use assigned to it, could ultimately be reopened as a, an elementary school and, and, and rebuilt. So there'd be enough capacity. So uh, the bottom line is that uh, the plan uh, is adequate 
in terms of providing. There will be enough capacity at the school level. There are plausible answers to that question, at least, for the 11,000 units that are being recommended in the plan. Okay. How much of it really depends on Parkside, Glenn? Is that pretty important? There are other schools. I mean, there are other, Woodside, for example, a major school which has a county facility in it, they could be moved out and that could be reopened as a school. So in any of these, either of those schools, and there may be even a third one, I don't recall off the top of my head, within the general area of the Silver Spring CBD, which could be reopened. And there is the potential for adding an addition to one of the other three elementary schools which do serve the area right now. Okay. All right. So if indeed, you know, as development is proceeding, we will be evaluating the school impacts as we go. If this plan were to fully build out, there's no question we would need additional capacity in the area. And where exactly that will be is not, we don't, you know, all we do is identify whether there is reasonable options. We don't identify what actually decisions would be made, you know, how that would be done. But we want to make sure there's reasonable options. Andrew. Yeah, I agreed on the last piece, Board of Education decides that we don't. But just curious, since Parkside is directly related here, since it was a parks site and parks is moving out, I mean, is park and planning turning that back over to MCPS? Do we have any indication or is parks staying in there for some other type of use? Could we just get a quick conversation? Parks is out of the building completely. And I believe it has been turned back. So yes, parks is out of Parkside 100%. So it goes back to the county. And then the county goes through an internal disposition process, right? That one belongs, I think that one actually belongs to the school system. So that one goes back to schools first. I can double check that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. So, I mean, that is important to note that it's not just a site that, you know, is there that is a current other use. It's an open site right now because the other use is now vacated. Okay, that's helpful. I have a quick question on the land use and zoning side of it. Is that Pam next? Okay, I'll wait for that. Land use and zoning part of Parkside or? No, no, no. The section of the discussion about the number of units and the number of jobs. I just had a quick question about that. Oh, gotcha. Okay. All right. We've identified reasonable options for school capacity. Obviously, a lot ahead of us, you know, as the plan builds out. And so duly noting that, you know, it's a meaningful issue, but one that we regularly address meaningful issues, you know, all around the county. Okay. All right. No further comments here. I think we're in agreement with noted requests for additional language. And thank you very much, Glenn. Pam, on to the hard part. Hi, good afternoon. I was going to say good afternoon. It feels like afternoon. We're almost there, yes. Good morning. Correct. We are now on what we labeled in the staff reports as Staff Report 1B, so a separate staff report that today is just looking at the plan-wide recommendations related to land use and zoning. And I think where Councilmember Friedson was headed was just even the very first paragraph, which says that, you know, the plan estimates that 11,000 new multifamily residential units could be built in the future under their estimate of the plan. Approximately 44,000 new jobs created. This is a 50% increase from today and up to 46,000 plus more people living in the downtown Silver Spring adjacent communities. And that's just text that was in the plan. I'll yield to Councilmember Friedson if that's a good place for his question. Yeah, I just had a quick question about the 44,000 new jobs and how that breaks down and what that's based off of. You know, I assume it's a combination of construction jobs and, you know, full-time ongoing jobs based on redevelopment. But if planning could explain that, that would be helpful. 
Sure, I can talk a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, about how we do the land use and zoning. Uh, <clears throat> we do the land use numbers and translate them. So there's basically, a, we come up with, you know, we look at the max zoning that we've got mapped. We look at, and overall we sort of <clears throat> took sort of a, maintaining actually the a similar balance that we have today to residential versus commercial with the you know look that with this plan we're hoping to see more commercial growth in Silver Spring but we felt that it was sort of overly optimistic to say that we thought the percentage would shift in the you know shift the balance from what we have today we're trying to maintain that balance we looked at the fact that we would not be growing any institutional use um I mean sorry not be growing any industrial use so keep that number not growing just keep the existing industrial uses which is what the plan recommends and then we will be growing the uses that we classify as other, which includes educational and institutional. So that speaks to some research, some educational facilities. We look at it just within that ORIO format, uh, which is how we do all of our land use numbers. Once we have um, sort of the breakdown in terms of we take the max that's mapped and break it out, looking at the existing and filling in the gap of what new opportunity sites might produce. Of course, it's all, at, you know, taking a, taking a shot and saying, what do we think is likely to develop on this parcel, on this parcel, on this parcel, in terms of residential versus commercial. So then we can obviously look at the units. That's easy. We have a basic metric that we say average size of a unit, and we just divide by the total number of residential square feet. That's the additional units. And for the jobs, it's really a, um, it's, it's just a mathematical factor that's saying, well, when you have this much commercial square feet, if it's this type of commercial, then that results in X number of jobs. If it's educational or institutional or research, it could be this number of jobs. So we sort of set up a framework and plug in numbers that, that had been, you know, we've been using uh, the same metrics across all the sector plans and across all of our um, land use numbers that we do for all of the projects in planning. Uh, and then we have sort of an estimate of that. And of course, if we had come up with a different land use vision, those numbers would shift. Um, and so we take our best guess by looking at all the opportunity sites and saying what do we think this site is most likely to develop as mixed use or just residential or mixed or just commercial or is this a site that we think would be um that we think is likely to develop as an educational site or as a you know lab or research type of use in the future basically just looking at what we know what we've learned from the engagement different site constraints adjacencies that sort of thing that's how we craft uh, a land use vision at a master plan you know we're looking at a forty thousand foot view, uh, and so that's where those numbers come from. Okay, I appreciate it. I, I only ask because you know, we are, as proposed in the plan at least, uh, equalizing the commercial and the exactly. residential, which presumably will have an impact on the breakdown, and so perhaps the split between residential and commercial may not be as consistent because we are making it easier in, in many ways to build housing, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that, but I think that's that's a change. And I think the 44,000 new jobs seems uh, ambitious and somewhat uh, aggressive and based on mind. some of the other decisions yeah. in, in the plan. But uh, I, uh, yeah, it, it's helpful for you to explain. Thanks. And I'll just say that's, you know, this, that's the sort of the standard way we do the land use numbers. What we don't do is say, well, we have these buildings that will never redevelop, so we're going to discount the extra FAR on those parcels. We don't get into that level of analysis, which will yield sort of a different vision. We sort of say we have all of this FAR, and we're going to say if it was all redeveloped and all realized, how could it fall out? And while, yes, the equalizing of the CNR leaves more flexibility, we did not have any, part, you know, with the with CR zoning still on every parcel, you were always allowed to build some commercial or some residential. We didn't have any parcels really that were, this only can be commercial. Um, we did have some that actually were pretty much almost all residential, even before you know we did anything. Um, but with the, with the equalizing of the CNR, obviously we're hoping we will be able to max out their FAR without saying, oh, well, I'm not gonna bother with the commercial, I'll just build to four you know, FAR residential, that's all I have. But I wouldn't, I don't know if that's necessarily gonna, would have changed the balance of, the balance of the uses is more determined by the market than it is by, uh, by the zoning. So we tried to look at what we have today and project kind of an optimistic, but not too far off from, uh, too far, too, too sort of uh, unrealistic scenario. Um, I would say it could shift a little, obviously, in either direction. We could end up with being able to have slightly more units than are proposed. But again, this is looking at the total max vision, which means that we're pretending like every single thing in the plan is fully, fully built up. Methodology is, if you keep the right. portion, uh, you know, more or less the same. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. 
All right. Thank you. Should we move on. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you, uh, Ms. Margaret. That was a um, really helpful explanation. We are um, just at the bottom of the first page where we are talking about the goals for the plan-wide land use and zoning section. Um, and the committee has seen most of these goals already. Um, they are similar or consistent with the goals that are in the review of the districts or in housing um, and even in parks and uh, public spaces. However, the first goal, which uh, states create opportunities for properties to obtain additional height and density, um, while it's been mentioned in previous work sessions, because we alluded to that obviously in the districts when we wanted to talk about the, um, the plan's recommendation on zoning, um, the concepts to develop and achieve this goal have not even been discussed. So that's really why we're uh, we're going to focus on today. And that first recommendation is the connectivity and infrastructure fund. And you've, you've already had a lot of conversation this morning about it with relationship to transportation. Um, and if you're on page two of the staff report, there's a, you know, take basically just straight from the plan what that definition is. Um, just want to make one clarification that the, the text in the plan made it seem like they were, the infrastructure fund would be levied on um, properties requesting additional density um, because they need it to achieve height, or if they do density averaging, or for bonus density for providing MPUs. And planning staff just clarified that, um, in fact, it was really just designed to be um, levied on or part of a contribution related to plans coming in for additional height, which coming in for additional density to reach their height. Um, not, not also levied or made a contribution for density averaging um, and for the provision of uh, MPUs. Um, so with that, the Connectivity and Infrastructure Fund, as this plan states, is designed to allow property owners the ability to purchase this additional density above their mapped um, density in order to achieve either their mapped height or additional height as allowed under the height incentive zone. Um, and the plan further states the fund will be implemented by the planning department under the direction of the board, um, and it states the contributions um, will be used to implement specific projects within the downtown Snow Spring, including a transit center arrival experience, bridge connection over the metro states, that's tracks, public bicycle parking facilities, green loop improvements beyond the frontier of a redevelopment site, select utility improvements, and other projects that are approved by the board, or identified by the board. Um, and, and in the plan, while it lists these things, there is not a lot of text that um, explains um, a lengthy explanation for, for why this is important. I and mean, we've heard Director Wright talk about this morning. Um, but as opposed to say Bethesda, where the plan was really framed around this idea for urban parks, um, there is less text connecting, you know, the, the necessity of a uh, connectivity infrastructure fund. Um, in the public hearing draft, this fund, the density fund, was proposed simply as a mechanism to allow um, the additional height that was being implemented through the height incentive zone to be achieved. Because you could imagine that if you have typical zoning across the plan area and an area which you want to allow one and a half times the height, a property would never be able to achieve that, most likely under their um, mapped density. And so the density fund was created to um, implement that ability to achieve that even higher height than the core. You need some more density to be able to achieve that height. Um, okay. And, oh, okay, so uh, thank you. Um, first of all, we've had a lot of conversation today about infrastructure and how to pay for it. And um, I, I think we should proceed as we've been talking about with refining what projects will be our priority projects for transportation capacity and charging for them through the unified mobility plan process. And um, so I, I don't think we want to create a reinvent I don't think reinventing the wheel is quite the right idea here, but create a, a duplicative process to charge also for infrastructure projects. And um, I'm concerned about the lack of emphasis on housing. Um, so I think we could discuss an alternative approach here about charging for density. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to find a number that is, I think, a wiser number, looking more to the long view here of generating a lot of property tax and income tax revenue through 
redevelopment, um, and then having the funds, uh, you know, devoted to goals that might not necessarily be the transportation goals. So, let's hear what uh, colleagues want to may want to say here, um, and uh, and we can put some new ideas on the table. Andrew. Yeah, uh, appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that um, the dynamic in the biz is that we do want height in areas that are closest in proximity to heavy transit, right? I mean, that's a main concept of the biz. That's where we want the greatest level of, of, of density. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we've done a lot of things at this council uh, to try to prioritize uh, that uh, in particular, and so you know, I, I am attracted to the idea of ensuring that there is uh, greater height uh, there. I think one of the challenges is whether or not um, we should be charging for height and charging for density when, uh, according to the packet, uh, you know, the additional height will require additional density. So we can, you know, I, I believe, you know, charge for density, and there's precedent for, for having done that um, uh, in uh, in other uh, other places. So um, if, if the interest was to not have uh, duplicative efforts uh, for infrastructure and some of the uh, questions, uh, you know, about the, the SIF in particular of, you know, how it would work and who would manage it, uh, you know, I do think that there could be an opportunity to uh, keep the, the bones of the, uh, uh, the biz uh, in terms of uh, height, but um, not necessarily charge for the height itself, but continue to charge for the density, uh, you know, which again, there's precedent uh, certainly for doing that. And uh, they tend to go hand in glove, right? If you get additional height and you're going to use it, uh, then you need additional density in order to, uh, to, to maximize it. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I do think that that money uh, to buy the height has to go somewhere. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think that there could be an opportunity, uh, you know, to fund housing uh, for that through the, the housing initiative uh, fund, you know, you call it a HIP payment if you wanted to, a housing infrastructure uh, payment. I've learned uh, through blog posts and, and, and others uh, uh, from the planning board chair uh, about housing being infrastructure and changing the way we view uh, housing uh, itself. And so I do think that there's uh, an opportunity to do that. Um, and while I'd be open uh, to uh, colleagues and, and, and what uh, what others think, uh, if we kept the biz, um, we can you know adapt boundaries if we need to, um, um, and, uh, but have that as an area that has additional height uh, and provide that height. So whether it's 50 percent, you know, 1.5 is what is currently comp contemplated. Uh, whether it's the full, you know, 50% above the map height, or whether it's a, a lower number like 30% above the map height, or somewhere uh, in between, I'd be open to that. I think we ought to discuss that, uh, and I think we ought to uh, maintain the 20% uh, 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 additional uh, height above the current uh, everywhere in the plan because we do want to incentivize redevelopment. We do want to maximize our ability to have a housing, and we do want opportunities to actually pay. Uh, for all of the uh, infrastructure that we have uh, that we have uh, talked about, so um, you know, I think the important piece here is uh, that um, if you are provided additional height, you more often than not, if not almost always, need additional density in order to achieve the height. So, if we're charging for the density, uh, then then uh, we're, we're you know uh, achieving uh, that goal without. Uh, essentially charging for what we want, which is height uh, uh, above transit as part of a you know, smart growth transit-oriented development strategy that this council has uh, repeatedly uh, 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 taken. Uh, the only other piece uh, for that uh, is uh, it's currently contemplated as a $5 charge. Uh, you know, I think we ought to discuss that, and whether it should be a, a lower charge, uh, say $3. You know, I'll just put that out there for, for the purposes uh, of uh, discussion and see, uh, you know, where we uh, uh, end up on that. So I put that all out there to say that I think the bones of this are really, really good. There's a lot of 
you know, really great ideas that have come uh, over to us. Uh, I think that uh, there's an opportunity for some uh, refinement and uh, the chance to, to move forward. So I'll just kind of put that out to colleagues for discussion and, and some responses from planning to get their uh, feedback and uh, see where, where this takes us. All right, thank you. We will circle back, uh, you know, noting each of those items that you've suggested, uh, which I think are good ones. I'd like to hear from Councilmember Joando, and then we'll go to Gwen. Well, I always love when there's two votes when I get to speak. It's great. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll, I'll ask I'll ask Ms. Wright to, to speak first, just because I'd like to hear her. I'll pose a question, and I'd like to come back and have another question. I'll, I'll say make some other comments, but. I think this is a little more than a refinement. I think this is a, a, a uh, you know, to the money would be going to the HIF would be a totally different proposal. And that's fine to make different proposals, but um, I think it's it's very different from going to the the infrastructure uh, goals that we just talked about in, in pre earlier uh, today. Um, and so I'd want to hear from, I guess, Ms. Wright, the, you know, you all did briefings behind the scenes, but I think the public could benefit from you know why to understand why you made this proposal what the financial some of the financial assumptions were and and in the kind of reasoning and thought process um i will say that one of the most common things we hear uh and we've gotten more we've gotten other people writing in during this process but just in generally relation in relation to development is the how are we planning for to pay for the infrastructure that will come with the development it's a huge problem. It's a nut we have not cracked well, if you know, and, uh, and it can't come from just one place, that's for sure. But, but we do know that everyone has to pay their fair share and it can't just be the county uh, and taxpayers. So uh, we'd like Ms. Wright to uh, talk about that and then I'll come back with one other question. Hey, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, or, yeah the planning has department. some comments too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that we have any fundamental objection to shifting the focus here from height to density. Um, there are some ways in which that makes the whole thing just a little bit uh, simpler, more elegant, perhaps. Um, I guess I, I just want to make two points. One is that I'm not sure shifting all the money into housing is the answer, affordable housing specifically, because in effect, what you're the, the, that message can be read as saying that, you know, when we ask for a per foot uh, fee for additional FAR for Bethesda, we're asking for additional amenities, uh, namely parks particularly, and Bethesda we thought were important, and that Silver Spring, what Silver Spring needs is primarily more affordable housing. I yield to no one in my support for additional affordable housing, but I think that, you know, if quality of place is a fundamental economic development strategy, as we believe that it is, and I think you all agree with that, then I think Silver Spring really needs some of these pieces like the Green Loop and the bridge, the pedestrian bridge and the like, not as transportation improvements, but in order to set it off and distinguish it as a really high quality place to live and work and, and where people are going to want to build things and people are going to, going to want to be. So I would encourage you to maybe think about putting it into infrastructure as opposed to just adding it onto housing, which we already are recommending a bump up from the base MPU requirements. And I think if you have concerns about administering that, you could set up a PDF for Silver Spring infrastructure improvements as opposed to having it be administered by the planning board, if that's your concern with not with the, you know, the way the fund is, is uh, doling out the money. The second thing I'd say is if you just bear with us, I think you know, you can set this price wherever you want, and the beauty of doing it in the ZTA is that you can change that over time. You can go up or down. We think $5 is very tenable in Silver Spring, and we believe our economic analysis is sound. I know you've heard from others who are suggesting it's not, but I, I hope you'll at least hear us out on the economics of, of this. And But I think that basically what I'm saying is we're not hostile to what Councilmember Friedson is suggesting, but we do think it's important that Silver Spring have an additional source of funding for these important these amenities because, as we discussed all morning long, you, everybody's talking about, geez, you guys have proposed all this additional stuff. Where's the money coming from? And while 
the uh, well the SIF won't pay for all of it. It is important to provide some supplemental source of revenue for these things that I, I hope we all agree are are really important, not just to make Solar Spring nice, but to make it economically vibrant and competitive and attractive uh, for the future. Thank you. And the, the only thing I would, would add to that, I agree absolutely with everything that Sherry Anderson um, just said, is that um, a couple of points. The, the height, I think we can easily go through and map the heights. That's not uh, difficult. It would be very difficult to go back and review, um, uh, as I think the council staff has pointed out, you know, appropriate FARs for every single property. Um, and you have to remember, we already have a lot of FAR on the table. There's probably over 15 million square feet of FAR on the table today in downtown Silver Spring. It's not like there is a lack of FAR. The um, other point that I would make in terms of the height was we were essentially uh, saying you could do it simply by providing a ground floor activating use. And we hope people will still do that, even if it's not a requirement for height. And so I think that, again, we can absolutely, uh, you know, map the heights. In terms of the density, I, um, you know, I really agree with, with Chair Anderson. The whole idea of this plan, if you go back to the plan goals, it's about connectivity. It's about quality of place. And I think that um, that is what is going to distinguish Silver Spring in the future. We are very fortunate. There is a lot of development going on today in Silver Spring. And we offer, we have some images if you want to see them, but we see great opportunities for future projects. I think the way those projects happen is if we make Silver Spring the desirable location. It's, it's, it's somewhat of a economic issue, but it's also somewhat of a psychological issue of really saying Silver Spring is a good place to live, work, and play, and that's why people want to be in Silver Spring. I think that um, it is important because we have already honestly pushed the envelope a little bit on the MPDUs. We have been told the, that by going from 12.5 to 15 percent MPDUs, that that is a big economic um, hurdle for some people in some projects. But we believe that is the commitment that we want to make to affordable housing in Silver Spring. And it's a very important and very big commitment. But we do think that we need the funding for all of those enhancements that we just talked about that are not absolutely requirements to move people through Silver Spring, but that enhance the environment in Silver Spring. And that's why the list that you saw was about improving the green loop, about putting the bridge across the tracks, about creating a special arrival experience at the transit center. Those are not um, necessities. No one will uh, not be able to uh, get from point A to point B without those items, but they are the kinds of enhancements that will make Silver Spring a place to uh, that people will, you know, perk up and take notice of and say, this is where I want to invest my money and create um, some great buildings. We, we, we absolutely do not agree that five dollars a square foot will stop projects from happening um, and our financial analysis shows that but the other thing again that's just an idea to put out there is that if you really are interested in particularly generating non-residential projects because we've heard folks being interested in um, office and so forth maybe that's where you drop the contribution for additional density to three or four dollars a square foot 
and keep it at five dollars for the residential just just a thought yeah thank you if i chime back in you you guys threw out a lot and i know that was going to happen whether it was my time or not so it happened there um you make some points i want to emphasize there is a lot of housing in downtown silver spring uh you know we're having a discussion now about how do we make sure that we adapt the infrastructure both physical and people based and safety based to keep up with the infrastructure in downtown silver spring uh, or with the uh house the additional housing and people and activity um and the growth and infrastructure policy you know we uh, we the council removed uh and uh and because most of this plan area is an opportunity zone there's already no impact taxes and fees for the vast majority of the of the places that we're talking about here except for the adjacent communities that are in the plan but for the heart there's no impact fees and taxes again this is an incentive this is you know this is saying if you want to do something higher uh outside of what's already mapped and you've already you, know, you heard from planning the idea that we can map additional height um I, you know so i think that we have to remember that context that there's already been a lot put on the table there's already a lot there there's already things in process as far as the housing side um i agree with you that we absolutely i would not support anything less than 15 percent on the mpdus i think that's that has to be the floor it was 12 and a half percent for and which is baked into the cost of land for since the 70s since we passed it and we have to make progress in this area certainly can handle it i also I, from the economic analysis i've seen which again could be conservative analysis uh you know because we again we don't know uh, there's things we don't know uh that five dollars uh is more than sufficient uh for making uh being able to keep projects going and have a profit uh, that's robust um, and and makes projects work, um, I would I, so in, in that sense, I, I don't I wouldn't support moving that number down. It, there was actually some of the analysis that said that ten dollars could work in some places, and and so I, I think you know this idea that we're you know we 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 have to keep lowering things, keep lowering things to make things happen. There's housing being built in downtown Silver Spring. Um, and we, you know, we've, we've been taking steps to, to enable that even more. What we need is we need more affordable housing. And then the, to the idea of shifting to the HIF, and we all love the HIF, but what that does uh, is, you know, we're saying, okay, pay into a fund and then we'll give you the money from the fund to subsidize the housing. It's like a double dip of, of, of sorts and for this incentive. I, mean, I just did that. Uh, for me, that's hard. The HIF normally is just to use to make it more affordable, which is a good thing. But if you're giving somebody, you're making developers pay into a, a payment to then pay back to pay them to make the housing more affordable. I just, I, I, I fundamentally have just kind of a angst about that. But uh, I think Chair Anderson brings up a point too that is very important that I share that, you know, the reason I support the green loop and all these infrastructure improvements um and uh, place making improvements i do think they're important and having seen silver spring develop uh over the course of my lifetime it has made a difference it makes a difference how people feel about where they where they live where they want to go or who, who wants to locate there what happens there um and so i i do think the mechanics of how we figure it out and the conversation we had earlier was very important about the the, the ump and what's in there and what's not and that was that was very clarifying but I do think that keeping this focused on infrastructure uh, improvements holistically, broadly, is a better goal. So, um, you know, that that's kind of where I am uh, at this point, but certainly I know there'll be continued discussion. All right, good points. Um, interesting. Um, not sure I disagree with much you said there. Um, okay, Councilor Friedson and then Gwen. Yeah, I appreciate it. So, first of all, uh, yeah, I, I think there's more agreement here than disagreement, first of all, so I just want to say that. Um, in terms of the housing uh, piece, 
That was in response to specifically the question of what what are we trying to achieve here? And I was told that the goal and the intention of this plan broadly and of the bid specifically was to maximize housing. And overwhelmingly, decisions that are being made in this plan are reflective of that, including providing the flexibility of uh, equalizing the C and the R uh, in order to uh, to do that. We've heard some complaints uh, and concerns uh, about that based on the fact that uh, office is already so difficult. Uh, and I've you know heard uh, the, I believe it was Ms. Wright, uh, although it could have been Chair Anderson, uh, you know, asking whether or not we make, you know, different charges, for instance, for office versus residential in order uh, to do that, which, you know, I'd be amenable to, uh, you know. Um, the, the challenge that I have, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm open to ideas. One, I don't, I, I don't love the idea of administering, uh, you know, another in the course of infrastructure uh, charges and programs um, when we have not done a particularly good job of implementing the ones that we already have on the books. It's, it's very difficult to pick what gets included to administer it. It's even more challenging when you have the disconnect between park and planning, which does not oversee this stuff, versus uh, the Department of Transportation. So I have some real angst uh, about that uh, disconnect just from execution of uh, the policy standpoint, although I totally understand why it's being put forward and appreciated. Um, in Bethesda, for instance, this was done for parks. And the elegance of that, not only is it you know, a quality of place and a you know, leading concern that was raised by the community uh, and, and is attempting to address it, um, and improving the, the, the livability uh, of, of the area as redevelopment occurs. Um, but the reality of that is that park and planning oversees the parks. And so it is a, a natural nexus that just seems to me to be a lot easier uh, to implement. So I was trying to uh, you know, address all that. Again, I, I'm amenable to, uh, to, to tweaks and, 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 and changes uh, to make this happen. The only other thing that I will say about the idea of well, we can't lower the amount and um, you know we need this for, 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 for other reasons is the, the idea that we do not have impact taxes in Silver Spring. And we do not have impact taxes in Silver Spring because we have made a policy decision that one, Silver Spring, based on all of the charges and costs that we have, uh, is not able to withstand that. Uh, on its own, uh, and number two, uh, that we want to incentivize uh, the uh, the growth and redevelopment uh, in uh, in Silver Spring. And admittedly, it's been more successful in building housing in recent memory than it has in building commercial in recent memory. And, and the numbers speak for themselves. And uh, uh, Ms. Dunn and her packet has a you know some staggering numbers about the the weakness in the commercial office. Uh, sector uh, in, in, in Silver Spring and how long it would take in order to get uh, to where uh, we, we would want to go. So I think it's a challenging uh, argument for us to make in terms of uh, competing public policies to say that uh, Silver Spring is uh, doesn't have impact taxes because it can't handle impact taxes because of uh, some of the weakness uh, in the market there. Uh, which goes to schools uh, and goes to transportation infrastructure. Uh, but we can easily absorb $5 or more, uh, you know, uh, additional uh, charges in, in order to move forward. I just, I have trouble kind of reconciling uh, those two uh, dynamics. Doesn't mean anybody's right. It doesn't mean anybody's wrong. It's just, uh, you know, that is a, a, a challenge. Right? So I'll just close and say, um, uh, on the mapping of the heights, I just was trying to make things simple. If, if the preference is to individually map heights, and the thought is that that can be done relatively easily, I am more than open for that. I do think that we should map heights or provide heights as we think are appropriate for the type of redevelopment that we want. Uh, I don't think we should charge uh, for them uh, personally. Uh, I agree with Councilmember Jawando, and I don't think there's any disagreement about 15% NPDU. I don't think anybody is interested in doing less. Uh, than that, that has become the standard. I think that's a positive. 
uh, and I think we should uh, move that forward. And I agree with planning's interest, by the way, uh, on the uh, ground floor activation. I think that that is the best practice for urban design. Uh, I just wonder whether or not um, requiring that in the master plan in order to get heights, for instance, is the most appropriate avenue to do that or through the regular uh, optional method development regulatory review uh, process, which seems to be uh, how it is traditionally uh, done. And by the way, that doesn't mean retail on the ground floor, for what I understand from uh, planning. It means activation, which could mean a lot of different things, and there will be some flexibility there. The idea that you're not walking by um, you know, a large block where nothing is uh, happening that's monotonous, whether it's a brick wall or whether it's something else that doesn't you know, invite a sense of uh, a place and, 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 and warmth and walkability and livability. So uh, I'll leave it at that, put that on, on, on the table. I am open to um, you know, where we direct the money uh, and, and some uh, tweaks, but I do have a challenge saying that uh, you know, uh, $5 can easily be afforded, uh, and yet we have made other significant decisions reflecting where the market actually is uh, in Silver Spring and some of the challenges uh, that it had. All right. Um, let me uh, let me continue the conversation here, throw out a couple of combination ideas, um, you know, building on Councilmember Duana's comments here. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, what we've heard is the overall plan area increase of height would be adopted, and I believe that's generally about a 20% height increase. Then you've created a height zone, which is a boundary and you allowed a new maximum height within the height zone, which on average is about 50%. And we would just say that is also allowed. You know, that's the height you can go to. And then um, in that area, and then you purchase density from the county in order to achieve your height if you need more density than you currently have. Under current law, which I don't think we would change, properties are either shifting density from one parcel that they own to another parcel, which they would still be able to do, or they're currently buying density from another parcel in order to shift it onto their parcel. So. I don't know what the market price of density is right now, but I'm told that the market isn't very functional. And this would create a very streamlined, efficient way to get the density that you need, a very predictable environment. You have a predictable height. There's no negotiation of whether you can go to that, and you have a very predictable price. Uh, whatever it is that you would be charged for your density. Um, the thrust of the housing strategy would be 15% MPDU, as we've discussed. And, you know, that's not nothing. <laughs> that has a huge impact on, uh, you know, the profitability of a building. Um, so, you know, we want to get that as much as possible and a, a 300 foot building is going to get us a heck of a lot more NPDUs at 15% than a, a 200 foot building, you know, at 15%. And so we want people to build as tall as we allow and deliver as many NPDUs as possible. As for the charge, the rate, I think I could be okay with $5 on residential and $3 on commercial. There really isn't a lot of commercial going on. I mean, I think there's an argument for no charge on commercial, frankly, because there's just no, we, we have a huge capacity, ex excess capacity. And I, I, I can't imagine, frankly, I don't know if, if, are you getting any conversation from property owners about office, you know, building new office? And I put not nice commercial. Private, yeah, not private um, folks building new office. We certainly have 
agencies like HOA, HOC, building a new office building, we have conversations going on with United Therapeutics about additional laboratory space, but we do not have uh, folks doing um, just, you know, office. There is, right. I mean, United Therapeutics is a special case. We're grateful for their presence and they continue to expand office for their own needs. You know, a private developer has not proposed building new office in downtown Silver Spring in a very, very long time. And that's not likely to change anytime soon. Um, you know, I, who knows when, but. And that's true in most of the county. And that's true in most right. of the county. That's true too. I mean, that's a, frankly, that's why we, that's all another conversation, you know, about that. Um, but downtown Bethesda is frankly the only place that high rise office is being constructed. And that appears to be a super premium market with just a very different environment, you know, than the rest of the county. But um, so uh, in any event, I think there is a reasonable argument here for not charging for commercial. And when I say, but you know, what category, what covers, what's covered by commercial? That's not just office. I think there's other, other things in commercial. So I want to explore that a little bit. All right, uh, customer Jawando followed by customer Fritz. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that just to be clear, you know, and, and uh, Director Wright and um, uh, planning staff know that this, you know, from our conversations that you know, I, I think I see a lot of this as the floor, you know, <laughs> you know, not not where we need to be. Uh, you know, as far as the 15%, uh, and as far as the 5%, I think those are, uh, you know, low. And I think the point that was made earlier about uh, we got rid of the impact taxes, uh, you know, housing was, was being built. Um, and I don't agree. I didn't agree with that decision. Obviously, the council made its decision. Uh, I didn't think we needed to uh, remove that uh, impact tax. We could have adjusted it. You know, I didn't think we needed to take the action we took. But uh, so for me, it's consistent to, to you know, uh, kind of charge this fee uh, based on the economic analysis we've seen. May, so, I, uh, may I just, we have not been charging that. So the yeah, housing correct. that has been built was built without having to pay that. Correct. Uh, I, I, again, don't think that those types of, you know, opportunity and zones and says we could, it's a whole nother conversation. I don't, you could argue whether it was necessary. I think we had a big discussion about uh, what the profit mar margins are and when we're putting, when we're giving uh, payment from county residents and foregoing or foregoing tax revenue. I think we're an investor in which we should know those things. Um, but it, that, that, that aside, uh, we were basically going on what people tell us and we, and we have to believe it. But, um, you know, so I, I think that I'm fine with, you know, if, if we can, I, I don't think for the commercial, we need to lower it, um, any, uh, you know, the, that, that dynamic is changing. I also would like to know what else is falls in the commercial bucket. Cause I think, you know, the office space trend, we just had a cog presentation, you know, Northern Virginia has the highest office office vacancy in the region. And, you know, and we're often, you know, flogging ourselves that we're worse than them, you know? So I think that market is completely changed in general. And we're trying to figure out the new normal. They also said that people don't want to go back to work five days a week. It's more like three days. And then what's the utilization going to look like? All that's changing. Um, and so I don't think uh, we need to know what's in the category of commercial other than office space. I'm assuming retail and things are in there as well. But uh, I don't see a need to go, you know, to change the number there. Um, considering also, and, and we haven't really talked about it. I don't know if it's in the, I have to look and see if it's in the packet, but the public should know, like, there's a lot less cost you know, if, if I remember correctly, you, cor you can correct me if I'm wrong, Miss Wright. But the 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 analysis that you all did 
on the commercial side with these heights, uh, the prop the, the return was better because there's a lot less cost associated, more cost associated with residential development as far as like what you have to provide and things. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember that being the case. But is that right? I think it was a particular type of office development. It was really when you had a sole user and you didn't have to worry about the lease up period. That's One right. of the things that's harder in residential is honestly, the bigger the project, the more units, the more risk you take on lease up periods. But in an office, if you have a set tenant, uh, like the Discovery Building had a set tenant, then um, there's less risk. Got it. Yeah. I'm, thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. My, my former my former employer where I used to sit in that office, um, which I'll point out on that is they were always going to leave when Zaslav bought the company because he's from New York and he never spent time in the office and, it was, and he wanted to move the company. Similarly, John Hendricks founded the company here and wanted to be here because he's from this area. But anyway, all the reasons that go into why companies move. Um, but I think that uh, the, so I would like to stay again. I, I think 15 is the floor. Five is the floor. You know, I'm not, I don't really going to move from that. What, you know, the other, my other two colleagues will do what they want, but that's where I am. And, uh, and I'd like to keep it going into the, some sort of fund that pays for the infrastructure. And uh, as discussed, that's, that's kind of my, my position at this point. All right, well, in reverse order there, I think we're all in agreement about 15%. Uh, I haven't heard anyone, you know, differ on that. All can right. Can we get 17.5? Can we go up? To no. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Definitely, uh, as I said before, definitely agreement on 15%. Uh, I think we all do agree that is uh, the floor. Um, and uh, the standard that we have set and should continue to be the standard that we set. Um, a couple questions. One, um, so I, I, I think the packet has been very clear that, uh, uh, and, 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 and made it very clear by council staff that $5, it will be very hard for Silver Spring to absorb uh, in this market. I understand there's a disagreement on that, but uh, I thought that the, the, the packet in that sense was compelling. And so I would be uncomfortable if our whole goal of this plan is to uh, incent redevelopment uh, to set a, a number uh, that our own uh, 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 staff is telling us would be very hard uh, to achieve. So I think we should go below five. Uh, what number that is, I suggested three. If we land on four, you know, I, I, I certainly could live with that. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, yield to colleagues on that, I understand council member Jawando, you know, you'd like to stay at five, respect that, understand that. Um, yeah, I do think that there is a compelling argument, certainly with commercial where we've seen tremendous weakness in the, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the evidence anecdotally is compelling and the, the data in the packet, I think is even more, uh, compelling on that. So, uh, you know, if, if, if we uh, had a differential rate, I also think, because we're equalizing commercial and residential, we're, we're going in the other direction with that. I think there's an argument to be made for providing that level of flexibility and making sure that we're getting the type of housing that we want, uh, but then uh, to, to charge uh, an equal amount for it as well when the market just isn't uh, there for it, I think is a bit of a challenge. So, uh, you know, if we go to $4 for residential and $1, let's say, uh, uh, for uh, 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 commercial, I think that that would be better. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll I'll just put that out there, and then you know I still think we have to decide on, on two things here. One, what does it go towards? And I understand uh, you know, I put out housing. Uh, if there's an interest in doing something else, you know, I, I'm amenable. This isn't a uh, philosophical view for me. It's a practical view, and it's a reflection of what you know I've been told the the, the purpose of the biz was. Uh, you know, this isn't a competition of what we value here, I will say. I mean, I think all of us value housing. We have proven that time and time again. Uh, you know, this plan uh, prioritizes housing, so I, I don't want uh, to make this uh, contest over that. And I think all of us are trying to achieve the type of place in Silver Spring uh, that would uh, attract investment, attract new residents, attract 
uh, new businesses. And so I, I, you know, I, I think we can have an honest uh, discussion without, you know, kind of competing over who values what, because I think we all are, are looking to achieve uh, similar goals here. Uh, and then I think we need to decide on, on the heights. Uh, do, you know, do we map the heights individually, which I'm certainly open to. I was trying to make things uh, simpler for everyone, but if there is an interest by, uh, by planning uh, to, to do that, I, I certainly think, uh, you know, that is appropriate. Uh, it, 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 it still would accomplish the density challenge that would be nearly impossible for us to do without uh, going back to the, the drawing board. And we'd allow the market to determine the density based on the, the heights, which I think uh, makes sense. Um, so I think that's that's a question of whether we sorry I don't quite understand there blanket amount to the zone sorry I'm not, right can we just I want to I'm not sure I understood that we were working towards an individual mapping of the heights per parcel versus you could get whatever I guess it's the, sort of functionally the same you Ms. Can, Wright yeah. noted it's earlier and one, I was reflecting that yeah it's six of one half dozen of right. another. I think we could put a general statement in saying everyone gets 20% or we could, you know, say in the height uh, area that people can get, you know, 50% more or go whatever, or we can map the individual heights. That's not a impossible task for us to accomplish. We're, we're, we're satisfying the, the density FAR issue. I think what, we're, what everybody is saying and the direction it seems that we're heading by charging for the FAR, we're not requiring planning to go back and determine property by property the FAR, which would be very, very difficult to do. Bad. So either really, way. And that's a, can we just pause there? It's yeah. also a bad idea to try to do it because agreed, agreed. It, yeah. it implies sort of knowledge about how density could be used that we really don't have. It's just, it's a good idea to say, Let's be flexible about that and allow them to come in and ask for what they might need under any number of different uses. And I will say that most residents I hear from don't discuss FAR. They discuss height, uh, whether they want height or they don't want height, uh, you know, in uh, their community, uh, you know, that is what they're focused on. That's what you see from the street. Um, so, you know, I do think, uh, uh, you know, from a planning perspective, uh, providing uh, some level of uh, market-based and, and flexibility related to the density and uh, really focusing on the heights, I think is appropriate, you know, in, in that uh, context. So um, anyway, I will throw out that I uh, would be willing, uh, from my perspective at least, for uh, some level of differentiation between commercial and residential, noting uh, the uh, uh, challenges to commercial in the marketplace and our interest in achieving the 44,000 jobs uh, as were described and all the other things that we've been doing uh, in this. Uh, I do think we should go below $5 though for, for residential. Uh, but if, you know, if it's not $3, what I have suggested, I'd be, uh, you know, I'm open to that uh, as well. And I do think we ought to decide, uh, you know, what this is going towards. And I think it's gotta be something that is very easy to implement. It's very easy to understand. Residents understand uh, what it is. The PIP does that in Bethesda. I think an unknown list of projects uh, as part of a future PDF that would be controlled by a different entity, uh, not park and planning is very, mm -hmm. very difficult. And I have personal uh, consternation about how that will work, especially because our track record on implementing uh, these types of uh, programs uh, is not great. And that's not because of park and planning, to be very clear. Uh, but but the county as a whole has has had challenges uh, determining what goes in there and then uh, you know following through uh, on what goes in there. So I think we got if if we are going to do something, it has to be simple, it has to be straightforward, and there has to be a nexus between who's controlling it and who's implementing it, or else uh, it's going to be uh, a quagmire. Uh, for us to, to, to deal with from my perspective. Well, we agree, which is why we tried to be very specific in listing projects. I think we, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that folks are finding it unclear because we listed very specifically the project, the bridge over the CSX tracks, the enhancements to the green loop, an ex a, a um, some sort of special um, treatment, whether it's a piece of public art or an enhancement to a building at the transit center. Um, 
you know, we also did mention utilities, but we'll take that off the table if you all think we should take that off the table. Uh, and I do want to also mention, again, this idea that, you know, you can't have a pot of money that is, um, you know, the future use is decided on. We have a long history of having amenity funds, and those amenity funds are in a designated um, pot. They are contributions from developers, generally, um, who have not been able to do their open space or do something else. And those funds can be used not just by park and planning, but by a variety of different governmental entities. We have worked with uh, BUP and provided mon money for funding of murals in Bethesda. We, we, you know, there are, this, this is not, I guess I'm just sort of saying this is not a brand new idea. <laughs> and there are ways to create, I think, you know, the chair, Anderson mentioned, you know, if it doesn't, if folks are concerned about it being under the control of MNC PPC, let's just set up a separate PDF and put the money in there and it will be used by the entity, whether it be DGS, DOT, or perhaps MNC PPC for some projects that will be uh, able to utilize this infrastructure, connectivity and infrastructure. Okay. All right, Councilmember Jawando. All right, uh, appreciate colleagues and the willingness to keep hashing this out. Um, so, why don't what I'd like to propose is a you know, kind of counter. We've had a lot of proposals and counter proposals here. Um, is that we do the five dollars for the commercial, the three dollars for the residential. And do what Ms. Wright just set up, uh, you know, set, just suggested based on what Mr. Anderson had said earlier, set up a separate PDF in the capital budget for this fund, uh, the connectivity and infrastructure fund that we can determine and put projects on, uh, you know, what the order is and what, what needs to happen. Uh, so I'd like to, you know, propose that. I do, on the point you brought up about what's on the list, one of the things that appealed to me the most, and again, I think is most responsive to res the residents need historically and currently about challenges with development. I think utilities should be on that list as possible. Again, we're going to decide if we set up a, a PDF, but I, I wouldn't want to explicitly eliminate that um, because I do think that's something that is an issue and comes up and, uh, and we all have a role to play in that. But um, so just back, just not to overshadow the, the first proposal. So I'm proposing $5 residential, $3 commercial, to council member Reamer's point, and I guess points that were made by both of my colleagues of distinguishing. And then a, I, we all agree on the 15% in PDU and then setting up the, the SIF as a, a separate PDF. All right. I, I'm, I, I'll agree with you. I'm prepared to go with that. Um, so the, the full proposal, well, actually, We'll keep this proposal to just what you've proposed. We previously discussed height, um, and so uh, we can just return to that. To um, I just want to be clear because there have been a couple things that have been yeah. floating around about height. So everybody gets twenty percent right. above their current height, which is what is the proposal? You know, the proposal in the, in the plan. plan, and then the business height incentive zone. This you know or whatever we ultimately call it in the final plan um, would be 50% above that mapped height. Above the 20%. So what, yeah. So it's be 70% above their, mapped their height. current height. The current height, whatever it is. I just want to make sure everybody is clear on that because that there's, whether it's 50% above their current height or 70% above their current height, those are two different numbers. So it's a simple example. It would be example. 300 feet as, you know, is yeah. currently proposed in, in the plan if, if we went. Right, as a simple right. example to make sure we all get it, if you had 100 feet of height, you're going to 120. If you're in the height zone. Well, you just talk about what you, get to, what you have to do to get it to. Also tie it all together. because Right I think now, what I'm hearing 
is that you don't have to do anything to get the additional height that we're now talking about, that it would be mapped. And again, to use a simple example, if you had a 100-foot current height, you'd go to 120. If you're in the height zone, you would get an additional 60 feet above that. So you would go to 180. That's 50% of 120 is 60, so you would go to 180. The maximum height is 300, except on some very specific blocks right at the transit center that could go to 360. And Can you still go? Can you still go to those 300 and those 360s under what we just discussed? I mean, basically, what I would like yes. to see is that we yes. are allowing the maximum heights that you have mentioned in the plan. We are allowing that. And then to Councilmember Joanna's question, if you don't have enough density today on your property already in existence, because every property today has a mapped density level. Right. So if you need to get density in order to go to that height, then you come in and you buy it. You ask for, again, I'm, I'm comfortable with this word buy that we've been throwing around. You request an allocation of density from the connectivity and infrastructure fund pool. And you would, I guess, based on Council Member Jawanda's proposal, which Council Member Reamer supported, you would um, have a fee of $5 per square foot for residential and $3 per square foot for non-residential. And that would be the only fee you would pay. There would be no fee for height. That would be mapped per the discussion we just had. And the SIF or Connectivity and Infrastructure Fund would be $5 for residential, $3 for non-residential. And again, the good news about that fee is none of that is actually in the plan. It is in a zoning text amendment for an overlay zone that you will be looking at simultaneous with the plan. Right. And because it is in the code, if at some point you find those numbers to be things that you would want to change for whatever reason, to go up or down, you can do that through a code change, not through having to amend the master plan again. Yeah. So there is an opportunity to adjust that per square foot dollar amount, depending on what you see. Yeah, well, before we move off of this point, I just want to make it very clear. So your initial, propo initial proposal did have, you did have to do something for the height as well. Could you just describe that so that we know what we're changing? Correct. And, you know? Correct. So for the height, what we had said previously was for residential projects, you had a choice. You could either go above 15% MPDUs, even, you know, just by one or two. You could, and this was a choice of either or, it wasn't right. and, it was or. Or you could make a contribution to the HIF Housing Incentive Fund, or you could demonstrate that you were providing an activating ground floor use, which didn't have to be retail, it could be a government use, it could be a school, it could be a daycare center, et cetera. Right. Those were the um, things in our original proposal that we said would be necessary to get the height. And that is what I hear the Fed committee saying they don't support, and which is what I said I'm actually fine with because I think the ground floor activating use was pretty much um, a gimme anyway. You know, because they, 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 do... they were going to be able to qualify right. anyway because they do that when they develop something residential right. anyway. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I just think it's important to make that clear to people. My last question, I know Councilor Freach has a hand up. The density versus the height, how, do we have a sense of is that going to be a real, you know, how many, what's the difference between people who actually need it 
and you know or areas that are actually zoned or, or you know for it that aren't and so this will this actually produce something <laughs> i'm going to let atara address that so we uh if we're still talking about having a height increase in the height incentive area which essentially covers the central core, right, most of Metro Center area, a little bit of downtown north, and a little bit into the Ripley District. In that zone, most parcels are zoned, FA, many parcels are zoned FAR 5, only a handful of eights, and almost all of those parcels are, they have a height already at 175 or higher. Right. Pretty much any of those parcels, like our example that we present in the financial analysis, it, the parcels vary by size, and there's different you know, some of them are more FAR than others based on the tract size, but sort of a rule of thumb, almost all of those parcels, if they wanted to reach the extra height, would need density to fill it. They even right. need density to fill their mapped height if they want to go that far. Of course, we've all seen development projects that come forward and just don't take advantage of everything on their site because of the project that they want to do, they find they can make a profit without going that far. So obviously we can't predict how many people are going to take advantage of this, but Almost every parcel in the height incentive area, um, because we gave a bump on the height and many of them already had close to 200 to begin with, and now they could go up to 300 or 260 in some cases, depending on the, the, the base height. Uh, all of those parcels, if they wanted to fill up the envelope, would need additional density. Outside of the height incentive zone, it's different. You have a lot of parcels that can fill their mapped height with the density they have. Um, you know, right now, the way the plan proposes it, that anybody could actually acquire additional density through the contribution if they wanted, even if they're outside of the height incentive zone. Right. We did find in our analysis there are a handful of parcels outside the height incentive zone that might want to pursue that. Our financial analysis did not necessarily show that that would work for every parcel, but again, in the name of flexibility, we felt that we offered that opportunity if in the future or it would be, it would be something that would be viable for a parcel. And this That's is all about flexibility. When you look at the Discovery Building, the Discovery Building did not build out its maximum FAR. They built what they needed as a company. And so not everyone builds out their maximum FAR. So what the whole plan is about is offering flexibility to address a myriad of development situations. Thank you. And I think that's important. Okay, I want to reiterate my understanding of what you had proposed was five dollars for residential, three dollars for commercial. Yeah, that's, that's and, the compromise on the compromise. Yes, right. Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, good conversation. I'm glad we are moving in a, a, a positive direction uh, for something that uh, will be a little bit easier to implement. And I think uh, that's good, and so I'm supportive of that. I, I would like to be uh, noted that I. Uh, proposed and uh, prefer a, a lower number per square foot uh, because of, you know, concerns as noted in the packet for the ability uh, of the market uh, to uh, withstand it. Uh, so I'm hoping that that could be noted. I, I also, you know, it seems clear that we're moving away from uh, it funding affordable housing, but I, I would prefer that it be noted that that was my initial proposal. Um, I will just say I am amenable to the amenity fund, but I don't think utilities should be included in this. I mean, we are not going to be talking about enough money to even come remotely close uh, to covering broad scale utilities work. We're barely going to be able to cover uh, some of the projects that we've uh, talked about here, certainly not in full. Uh, and I don't think, um, I think it would be different for, projects like these to cover utilities. I mean, that's, that's you know, as part of a, you know, an outside, uh, you know, additional uh, fund. So I, I'll yield to colleagues on that as well. But uh, if colleagues, you know, don't agree with that, I, I'd like it to be noted that I also didn't think that, uh, you know, this should go towards uh, utilities. I think it should go towards the placemaking and the livability and the you know, type of amenities that, you know, were discussed. I think that's the, the primary uh, uh, purpose uh, as uh, as uh, described. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, to make sure, you know, those were, were noted. 
I mean, I, I suppose I agree. Just because, first of all, as you said, I don't think there's going to be enough money here to do a whole lot of projects. And so, you know, I would rather the community get something more visible than, you know, a utility project that's underground. And then I just have one last uh, question here, and I know we're, we're getting towards time. Yeah. Um, I know it's my understanding from council staff, and maybe Ms. Dunn, you could clarify, but uh, some of the individual properties and some of the questions and concerns that were raised, we're going to take that up at the next meeting. Is that the thought process? Um, I hope to take it up at the next meeting, but I am finalizing the staff report for Thursday now, and it's already at 100. No, it's 100. It's at 21 pages, and uh, I haven't quite gotten to the property specific stuff that we wanted to circle back to. So we may either have to look for one more date, or we may have to cover those at council, and we can discuss that offline. Okay, but it, but not to me, that's fine. The only one related, because it's kind of related to this and not necessarily, uh, is the question about uh, the biz itself and its boundaries. Are we going to take that up as part of that conversation, or uh, or today? I just note the the block bounded by Cameron Spring and Georgia, uh, specifically. Um, I you know there's been discussion of whether or not that should be included. Uh, in the biz or, or not, I'm hopeful that it, it it can be and it will be. And I don't know if it's more appropriate to take that up subsequent if, or if we could just do that now. If the committee wants to weigh in on that block with this conversation, that would be great. It would knock one more thing out. We could do it quickly. Was that not in the biz already? No. So that's essentially extending it all the way along Spring Street. Is that what you're saying? It, it's really. I think Cameron. planning place. I think it is spring to planning place. But I could be wrong. I, I'm just trying to remember. Ah, so it's all the way spring. along the edge of spring to Georgia. Yeah, there, there, there's a couple of reasons for this. One, there's an opportunity for re redevelopment here long term. Uh, and this is a long term plan. And so I think we should provide that level of flexibility. Uh, but also, uh, there's an opportunity, uh, you know, potentially with some of these properties to transfer density with commercial use and, and actually move some of the height away uh, from uh, the abutting neighborhoods. And so I, 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 to me, I think that additional level of, of flexibility would be uh, helpful. The opportunities there for uh, uh, commercial are important. It's one of the you know challenges that this plan has that we need to overcome and hopefully the market will be able to overcome it. And so, um, I just put that forward yeah. now, whether it's expanding the boundary of the biz by that block. Correct. Okay. I could be okay with that. Um, any comment there from planning? And then we really do need to cut out. Councilmember Juan has given it the thumbs up. No, no, no. That was, I just want to oh, say that was a raise. That was, that was a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We don't well, have an objection from planning. Okay. No objection from planning. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it's hard for me to, I fully wrap my head to conceptualize. I, I think I know what we're talking about, and I want to. I'd want to think about it a little more. Um, it's it's helpful to hear the planning doesn't have an objection there. Um, it's the so parking lot today, right? Isn't that what we're talking about? It's presently like the parking lot along Spring it Street. Includes garage too. Yes. It's the parking structure. Oh, it includes garage too. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So I I I just. I don't have an opinion on it right now because I need to think about it more. Uh, so I, I don't want to, I personally wouldn't want to, for that reason, wouldn't want to move it forward at this point. Uh, but I did want to say for Ms. Dunn for the packet, you know, while I proposed the five and the three, I, I actually, as you might imagine, I think the analysis showed that 10 could work in some <laughs> dollars. So I think if we're noting that, I, I just like to note that that was my compromise position. I think it, I think that analysis bears out that it could it could do it. So just want to make sure that that's clear for when colleagues are taking this up at the next next step. All right. So two to one or two to zero to one on expanding the boundary of the biz. Customer, did you want to abstain on that or or uh, uh, vote no on that? The specific proposal. I'll just I'll, I'll vote no on. It. Okay. Two to one on that. Um, okay. Well, actually, we have a plan. Um, okay. So we have another session on Thursday, and we can come back to loose ends and other things. Right, Pam? What's... 
Uh, well, that's my hope, but we have other plan wide recommendations to get through on Thursday. We'll just have to see. We'll, we'll plan to come with you as much as we can. Um, like I said, the staff report currently gets through all the rest of plan wide recommendations. It's at 21 pages and we have yet to get to uh, implementation and some follow up material. Okay. So we'll have to talk offline. So plenty to work on on Thursday. You tackled some big ones though. You know, we did. All right. Uh, thank you. Appreciate was, the work today. Was the vote three three zero on the price? Well, that's a good question. I guess we didn't I'm actually. Sure there. I know you wanted uh, noted, you know, but it, were you supporting the proposal or no? So you made a motion. Well, so the motion before yeah, us. If we're voting on everything in aggregate, like five on, and three. on the on the SIP or whatever we're going to call well, it, then I vote to move forward. The, you know, the changes that we make. If we're individually voting on. The price structure of five and three, then I would make it a two to one vote, right. and I thought it should be lower. Got it. That, if, you know, and I, however, that is determined. I don't feel strongly about it one way or the other, to be honest with you. As long as it's noted, I, you know, I think it's important, and I think it is appropriate for Councilmember Jawando's, you know, thinking it should could stay at five, but compromising to five and three also is appropriate. Yeah. You know. So we had one council member at 10 and we had one council member at three and we landed on five. There you go. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate your time. And um, the council will be doing state legislation momentarily. So thanks. Doug. Take care. And the gym teacher called me over and he said, you know, you're getting in with a bank.